Chapter One of The Love of Monsieur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva. The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. Chapter One The Fleece Tavern. Who is this Mornay? captain cornbury paused to kindle his tobacco mornay is of the embassy of france at any game of chance the luckiest blade in the world and a diamond for success with the petticoats whether they're doxies or duchesses so ho a pretty fellow a french chevalier a fellow of the marine but a die juggler a man of no caste sneered mr wynne he has a wit with a point ay and the rapier too said lord downey the devil fly with these foreign lady killers growled wynne again oh mornay is a man-killer too <laughs> never fear he's not named brad affair for nothing laughed cornbury bah said a voice near the door a foundling an outcast a man of no birth i'll have no more of him captain ferrers tossed aside his coat and hat and came forward into the glare of the candles beside him followed the tall figure of sir henry heywood whose grey hair and more sober garb and lineaments made the gay apparel of his companion the more splendid by comparison captain ferrers wore the rich accoutrements of a captain in the bodyguard and his manner and address showed the bluster of a bully of the barracks the face somewhat ruddy in colour was of a certain heavy regularity of feature but his eyes were small like a pig's and as he came into the light they flickered and guttered like a candle at a puff of the breath there were lines too at the corners of the mouth and the pursing of the thin lips gave him the air of a man older than his years come ferrers said cornbury good-naturedly give the devil his due wynne laughed god man he's given him his due aren't he ferrers the captain scowled you faith i am two hundred guineas the gan last night may the plague take him such luck is not in nature he wins upon us all by the lord said cornbury stoutly heywood sneered bah you irish are too easy with your likes and uh, dislikes too returned cornbury with a swift glance for snapped ferrers the man saved your life but you can't thrust him down our throats captain cornbury he's cooked his goose well this time thank god said wynne we'll soon be rid of him another duel asked heywood carelessly what cried downey have you not heard of the struggle for precedence this afternoon why man tis the talk of london to-day there was a fight between the coaches and retainers of the embassades of france and spain thanks to mornay the french coach was disastrously defeated by the spaniards there is a great to-do at whitehall for the grand monarch thinks more of his prestige in london even than in paris god help the man who thwarts him in this it is death or the bastille and our own king would rather offend god than louis and mornay as for mornay for an answer lord downey significantly blew out one of the candles upon the table <laughs> that is what will happen to mornay the story is this the coaches were drawn upon tower wharf waiting to follow the king in the french coach were seated mornay and the son of the ambassador in the spanish coach were baron de batteville and two ladies 
after his majesty had passed both the french and spanish coaches endeavoured to be first in the street which is here so narrow that but one may pass at a time the frenchman had something of the advantage of position and cutting into the spaniard with a great crash sent the coach whirling over half way upon its side to the great hazard of the spaniard and ladies within then mornay who has a most ingenuous art of getting into the very thick of things leaped upon the coachman's seat and seized the reins of the coach horses he was beset by the spaniards and cut upon the head and he hung on what do you think the fellow did pull the french horses back in the side and let the spanish coach down upon four wheels and out of danger was it not a pretty pass the rest was as simple as you please the spaniard whipped and though smashed and battered won fast through the narrow passage and mornay does not deny it he says it would have been impossible for a gentleman to see such ladies thrown into a dirty ditch water and the ladies man who were the ladies said ferris ha ah, that is the best of it the spaniards relate that mornay came down from the coachman's seat wiping the blood from his cheek to one of the ladies he said madame the kingdom of france yields a precedence only to a rank greater than majesty the honour france loses belongs not to spain but to the beautiful barbara clark sir henry haywood caught at a quick breath mistress clark my ward captain ferrers looked from downey to cornbury only to see verification written upon their faces he pushed back his bench from the table his countenance fairly blazing with anger and cried in a choking voice mornay again to drag her name into every ordinary and gaming hell in london coxcomb scoundrel upstart that he is mornay always mornay the candles flickered gaily as m mornay entered his figure and costume were the perfection of studied elegance the peruke was admirably curled and the laces and jewels were such that a king might have envied him a black patch extending along the forehead gave him an odd appearance and the white brow seemed the more pallid by contrast his features in repose bore the look of settled melancholy one sometimes sees on the faces of men who live for pleasure alone but as his eyes turned towards the table a smile full of careless good-humour came over his features he advanced pausing a moment as wynne and heywood pushed ferris down by main force into his seat messieurs said mornay smiling quizzically your servitor he stopped again i thought my name was spoken no he looked from one to the other my name i comprehend but monsieur my titles my new titles to whom am i indebted for my titles ah monsieur le capitaine ferrer mon ami i am glad that you are here i thought that i had fallen among enemies he laughed gaily it was rippling and mellow a laugh from the very cockles of the heart full of the joy of living in which there lurked no suspicion of doubt or insincerity the situation was so vastly amusing cornbury laughed too he was an irishman with a galloping humour nor was downey slow to follow his example for heywood and ferrers it was another matter the elder man sat rigidly 
glaring at the frenchman with eyes that glittered from lids now with hate ferrers disconcerted by the defenselessness of the frenchman sat stupidly his features swollen with rage his lips uncertain and trembling for a word to bring the quarrel to a head but before he could speak sir henry heywood very pale had thrust himself forward over the table to mornay in a way not to be mistaken and said briefly cat sirrah your laugh is the sign of an empty mind mornay was truly taken by surprise but as he looked up at this new enemy he found no difficulty in understanding heywood's meaning he rose to his feet still smiling and said coolly with a sedulous politeness i am empty of brains it takes a wit like that of monsieur to discover something which does not exist captain ferrers had floundered to his feet blustering and maddened at being cheated out of his quarrel he burst violently upon the colloquy and seizing heywood by the arm dragged him back to the window-seat tis not your quarrel heywood he began but sir henry shook himself free of ferrers and they both faced monsieur mornay who somewhat languidly but with a polite tolerance stood leaning against the table watching this unlooked-for development of the drama monsieur he smiled an embarras de richesse never have i been so greatly honoured i pray that you do not come to blows on my account one of you might kill the other which would rob me of the honour of killing you both captain cornbury until this time had been an interested and amused onlooker he dearly loved a fight and the situation was enjoyable but here was the evening flying and his game of cards gone a glimmering zounds gentlemen he broke in a pretty business to fight at the fleece tavern pleasant reading for the courant a fitting end to a comedy begun upon the street tis not your quarrel cornbury growled ferrers nor yours ferrers said heywood coldly you see monsieur said mornay to downey with mock helplessness there is no help for it cornbury swore a round oath i faith i wash my hands of ye if fight ye must quarrel decently over the cards man but do not drag a lady's name through the streets of london mornay turned to cornbury it is true mon ami it is true then in a flash gaily aloud almost like a child he shouted allons time is flying to-morrow we shall fight but to-night to-night we shall play at quinze monsieur ferrer you owe me three hundred guineas we shall play for these if you win you will die to-morrow with a clear conscience if you lose monsieur i'll be your undertaker come metaux d'urte wine End of chapter 1。How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter Two of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva.
mistress barbara dances the coranto mistress barbara's deep abiding dislike for monsieur mornay began even before the struggle for precedence between the french and spanish coaches such an incident grown to international importance might have turned the heads of ladies with greater reputations than hers nor should it have been a small thing that a reckless young man had risked his life to say nothing of his honor in her service and got a very bad cut upon his head in the bargain but mistress clark was not like some other ladies of the court she had heard of the gallantries of monsieur mornay and had set him down as a woman hunter and libertine a type especially elected for her abomination his recent attentions to the countess of shrewsbury and the engaging mrs middleton were already the common gossip of the court she herself had seen this man perfumed and frilled flaunting himself in hyde park or the mall with one or the other of his charmers but the assurance which made him successful elsewhere only filled her with disgust what the english women could see in such a fellow it was difficult for her to determine he was certainly not over handsome what strength of face possessed she ascribed to boldness what pride in the curve of the nose and lips to arrogance what sensitiveness and delicacy of moulding in lip and chin to puny aims and habits of fellows of his trade she was a person who divined rapidly and with more or less inaccuracy and so she had prepared herself thoroughly to dislike the man even before his own presumption had heightened her prejudice mistress barbara had first won and now held her position at court not by a lavish display of her talents and charms but by a nimble wit and unassailable character and sincerity qualities of a particular value because of their rarity this was the reason she could discover no compliment in the gallantry of m mornay on tower wharf for beneath the mask of his subservience she discovered a gleam of unbridled admiration which compliment though it might have been from another from him was only an insult several days of deliberation had brought no change in her spirit she resolved as she put the last dainty touches to her toilet that if m mornay again thrust his attentions upon her that night at the ball of the duchess of dorset she would give him a word or two in public which should establish their personal relations for all time and as she stood before her dressing-table her mirror gave her back a reflection which justified her every jealous precaution the candle shimmered upon the loveliest neck and arms in the world the forehead was wide white and smooth and her hair rippled back from her temples in a shower of gold and fell in a natural order which made the arts of fashion superfluous her cheeks glowed with a color which put to shame the rouge pot in her toilet closet she was more like some tall norse goddess with the breath of the sea and the pines in her nostrils than a figure in a world of luxury and pampered ease her eyes clear and full were strangers to qualms and apprehensions and the thought of a possible scene with this impertinent frenchman gave them a sparkle which added to their shadowed lustre in the thinking she did m mornay the honour to add 
just one more patch to her chin and then of course if trouble arose and the worst came there was captain ferrers whom she might marry some day or her guardian sir henry hayward who could be called upon little did she know of the meeting between mornay and sir henry arranged for that very morning which had miscarried because of an untimely intervention by the watch the duke of dorset danced well when mistress clark entered his ballroom the tabors were sounding for a brawl his grace espied her at this moment and coming forward with an air of the grand seigneur which many a younger man might have envied him carried her off under the very noses of wynne howard russell and jermyn to say nothing of captain ferrers who had brought her there in his coach it was a very merry dance better suited to young legs than to old and mistress barbara with a rare grace put even his grace's spryness to the test monsieur mornay who had just come in made to himself the solemn promise that if it lay in his power she should favour him upon that evening if he suspected that she would receive him with an ill grace he did not show it for he made no scruple to hide his open admiration as she danced along the gallery twice she passed the spot where he stood and once she looked quite through him at the blank wall behind but unabashed when the dance was done he lost no time in letting the duke of dorset know that he wished to be presented in such a manner that recognition would be unavoidable with all the good will in the world said his grace another moth to the flame he laughed another star to the constellation be careful sir frenchman tis not a lady pleased with frivolity monsieur behold said mornay piously i am as solemn as a judge as virtuous as ma foi as a virtuous as a she-dragon duenna of the queen now will that please her better said captain cornbury who had come up at this moment i faith monet she is most difficult as full of whims as the multiplication table at present she spends both her time and her fortune where do you suppose monsieur mornay in the fire region and the prisons strange tastes for the heiress of half a province in france and the whole of the fortune of the brisacs ma foi in serieuse oh, she's saucy enough with a bit of a temper too they say but the prisons ah but her trade to-day perhaps to-morrow that's all what do you think she has but just promised the coranto and an hour alone in the garden to the man who brings her nick rawlings pardon from the king the cutpurse the very same she says tis an old man and ill fit to die upon the scaffold par dieu said mornay casting a swift glance at her train of followers she's more cruel to her lovers than to her poor cornbury laughed i faith so far as she's concerned they're one and the same i'm thinking a stroke of genius mornay have yourself but thrown into prison and you may win her after all he moved away mornay looked around him for this scornful mistress but she had gone into the garden with captain ferrers mordieu he growled there's truth in that jest in prison i'll be soon enough unless the king he paused with a curious smile the king aha i've a better use for charles than that and he made his way to the retiring room where his lackey vigot resplendent in a yellow coat and black waistcoat was awaiting his orders 
the night progressed came next the country dances invented upon a time by his grace of buckingham's grandmother to introduce to the court some of her country cousins hoydenish they were but the sibilance of the silks and satins and the flaunt of laces robbed them of much of their rustic simplicity mistress clark her color heightened held her court up and down the gallery till mr stuart and my lady chesterfield in turn jealous of their prestige called their recalcitrant admirers to account his grace of dorset somewhat red and breathless could contain himself no longer by my faith he said castlemaine and hamilton had better look to their laurels nay she has a wit as pretty as that of my lord of rochester but cleaner put in german dryly in the meanwhile monsieur mornay had received a packet in god's name what have you done it ran you juggle too lightly with the affairs of nations monsieur mornay tis a serious offence for you and means death or the bastille at the very least here is what you ask i have no more favours to give leave london at once or when the post from france arrives i cannot help you see mornay looked at it curiously with pursed lips and loose fingers and then rather a bitter smile came over his features twas too strong a test of his fellowship he muttered too strong for his friendship even he shoved the document among his laces and moved to the gallery where the gentlemen were choosing their partners for the coranto he sought the duke at once his grace was standing near mistress barbara's chair watching with amusement a discussion of the rival claims of the earl of st albans and captain ferrers upon her clemency for the dance your grace said mornay i claim your promise i am for the coranto with la belle barbara my word mornay you are incurable a disease monsieur i think fatal mistress barbara beamed upon the duke ferrers made way he did not see the figure at the heels of dorset madame said his grace with a noble flourish of the arm i present to you a gentleman of fine distinction in germany and england a gallant captain in the marine of france rene bras de fer monsieur le chevalier mornay during the prelude she had sat complacently a queen in the centre of her court but as mornay came forward she arose and drew herself to her splendid height looking at the frenchman coldly her lips framed for the words she would have uttered but monsieur mornay spoke first madame he said quietly his hand upon his heart i am come for the coranto she looked at him in blank amazement but for a moment no sound came from her lips monsieur she stammered at last in breathless anger monsieur mornay affected not to hear her the coranto madame he said amusedly madame has promised me the coranto tis an intrusion monsieur she began her breast heaving mornay had drawn from his laces the pardon of nick rawlings before she could finish he had opened the paper and handed it towards her it is the pardon madame that was all he said but the crimson seal of the crown dangling from its cords caught her eye and half bewildered she glanced down over the writing clemency thief murderer nick rawlings pardon a pardon for me monsieur monsieur mornay showed his white teeth as he smiled madame forgets her promise of the coranto voila here is the pardon there is the musique will madame not dance 
a silence had fallen upon those within earshot and not a couple took the floor for the dance his grace of dorset looked serious sir henry haywood thrust himself into the circle but the music tinkled bravely and monsieur mornay still stood there awaiting her reply the struggle lasted for some moments she turned white and red by turns as she fought for her self-control and pressed her hand to her breast to still the tumult which threatened to burst from her lips captain ferrers made a step as though to come between them but monsieur mornay did not notice him nor until then did mistress clark break her silence stop captain ferrers she coldly said i will dance with this this monsieur mornay her tone was frozen through and through with a bitterness of utter contempt and then giving mornay her fingers she went with him to the middle of the gallery while the company too interested or amazed to follow in the dance stood along the walls of the ballroom mistress barbara clark and monsieur mornay ran through the mazes of the dance mornay moved with an incomparable grace and skill it was a dance from paris and every turn of the wrist neck or heel proclaimed him master from his face one could only discover the signal joy he felt at being honored by so gracious and beautiful a companion the countenance of mistress clark betrayed a less fortunate disposition in the bitterness of her defeat by this man whom she had promised herself publicly to demean she maintained her outward composure with difficulty the physical action of dancing gave her some relief but as she faced him her eyes blazed with hatred and her fingers fairly spurning a contact chilled him with the rigidness of their antipathy twice they made the round of the room when ferrers who had mounted the steps into the loft bade the musicians stop playing a look of relief chased the scorn for a moment from mistress barbara's face and as though half unconscious of mornay's presence she said aloud in a kind of gasp thank god tis done they stood opposite an open window that led to the garden mornay frowned at her and the hour alone he asked surely madame cannot so soon have forgotten her gray eyes had turned as dark as the open window looking into the night and the lids which her scorn let down to hide her anger concealed but in part the smouldering light of her passion it is preposterous monsieur she said chokingly i cannot i will not and your promise madame mistress clark will forget her promise she looked about helplessly as though seeking a way to escape but mornay was merciless perhaps madame you fear he said ironically he had judged her aright with a look that might have killed had mornay been made of more tender stuff she caught her gown upon her arm and swept past him out into the darkness of the terrace beyond the air was warm and fragrant full of the first sweet freshness of the summer the light of the moon sifted softly through the haze that had fallen over the gardens and trembled upon each dewy blade and leaf it was so peaceful and quiet so far removed from rancor and hatred a night for fondness gentleness and all the soft confidences of a tenderness divine and all excelling a night for love this thought came to them both at the same moment to mistress barbara with a sense of humiliation and anger followed by a burst of passion she had struggled so long to control she stopped in the middle of the garden walk and turned on him you she cried immoderately 
you again has a lady no rights to which a man whatever he be is bound to respect why do you pursue me listen to me monsieur mornay i hate you i hate you i hate you and then overcome by the very excess of her emotion she sank to the bench beside her monsieur mornay stood at a distance and occupied himself with the laces at his sleeves to a frenchman this was surely an ill requiting of his delicate attentions madame he began calmly then paused no madame does not mean that he made no attempt to go nearer but stood his hand resting upon the hilt of his sword his eyes dark and serious looking quietly down at her she made no reply but sat rigidly her arm upon the back of the bench the seat of which her skirts had completely covered there was no indication of the turmoil that raged within her but the tapping of her silken shoe upon the gravel walk how have i offended madame he continued is it a fault to admire is my tribute a sin is my service a crime have i not the right of any other of your poor prisoners to do you honor from afar from afar she asked coldly satirical mornay shrugged his shoulders with a pretty gesture ma foi madame my mind cannot imagine a greater distance between us monsieur's imagination is not without limits she interrupted and then after a pause in england a lady is allowed the privilege of choosing her own following in france he replied with an inclination of the head in france the following confers an honor by choosing the lady yes in france monsieur there was a hidden meaning to her words he thought for a moment before replying but madame is of the house of france the english mistress clark is also the french vicomtesse de brezac she turned fully towards him and met his gaze steadily but thank god the part of me that is english is the part of me which scorns such attentions as yours to be the object of a, such gallantries is to be placed in a class she paused to measure out the depth of her scorn in a class with your shrewsburys and middletons it is an insult to breathe the air with you alone my cavaliers are gentlemen monsieur and in england she broke off abruptly as if conveying too full an honor by conversing with him and then womanlike why did you save the spanish coach she cried passionately monsieur mornay smiled blithely madame would not look half so handsome dead as she does alive he took a step as though to go nearer and she rose to her feet turning towards the house come nearer monsieur and i-i leave at once mornay's brows contracted dangerously as he said the hour is mine and then with an angry irony you need not fear me madame i am no viper or toad that you should loathe me so she looked defiantly up at him there are things even less agreeable than toads and vipers the words dropped with a cold and cruel meaning from her lips in a moment she would have given her fortune to withdraw them monsieur mornay stepped back a pace and put the back of his hand to his head where a patch still hid the scar upon his temple he stammered painfully and lowered his head as though bowing to some power over which he had no control you you mean the misfortune of my birth mistress clark had turned her face away again 
she put her hand to her brow her look steadily averted deep down in the heart she so carefully hid she knew that what she had done was malignant inhuman whatever his sins of birth or education was he not built in the semblance of a gentleman and had he not jeopardized his life and good repute in her service it was true whatever his origin his frank attachment deserved a better return than the shame she had put upon it if he had not stood there directly before her she would have said something to have taken a bitter sting from her insult but as she felt his eyes burn into her she could not frame her words and her pride made her dumb madame has heard that he stammered and then without waiting for a reply he said with a quiet dignity it is true i think if madame will permit i will conduct her to the gallery mistress clark did not move her eyes were fixed upon the swinging lanterns at the end of the terrace come madame i give you back your hour he said nick rawlings and i will take our liberty together if you will but allow me there was a sound of rapid footsteps upon the walk and three figures came into the glare of the shifting lanterns in the colored light mornay could dimly make out ferrers haywood and wynne haywood peered forward into their faces enough of this he said sternly mistress clark be so kind as to give your arm to captain ferrers if you will but take her to the duchess ferrers mistress clark had arisen to her feet and looked from her guardian to monsieur mornay who stood at his ease awaiting their pleasure she opened her lips as though to speak but the frenchman with an air of finality which could not be mistaken bowed low and then turning coldly away stood facing the darkness of the garden End of chapter two Chapter three of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur Mornay becomes unpopular. The footsteps of Mistress Barbara and Captain Ferrers vanished into the night. Sir Henry Haywood moved a step nearer Mornay, and the Frenchman turned. His face shone with an unwanted pallor and an air of distraction had settled in the repose of his features which the dim light of the swinging lanterns could not conceal his eyes dark and lustrous looked at sir henry from under half-closed lids a little ennuyé but with a perfect composure and studied politeness it is unfortunate that we cannot seem to meet said sir henry struggling to control himself i am bereaved monsieur de haywood perhaps to-morrow to-morrow broke in haywood violently there may be no to-morrow i will meet you to-night monsieur here now at this very spot he nervously fingered the laces at his throat monet paused a moment monsieur de haywood would violate the hospitality yes interrupted haywood we shall have no constables here but monsieur enough will you fight or shall i he made a movement towards mornay there came so dangerous a flash in the frenchman's eyes that haywood stopped mornay drew back a step and put his hand upon his sword at last sneered haywood at last you understand mornay shrugged his shoulders as though absolving himself from all responsibility eh bien he said it shall be as you wish 
there had been so many duels with fatal results in london during the last few months that it was as much as a man's life was worth to engage in one either as principal or second but this affair admitted of no delay and ferrers and wynne had so deep a dislike for mornay that they would have risked much to see him killed wynne found captain cornbury who hailed with joy the opportunity of returning mornay a service the frenchman had twice rendered him the gentlemen removed their periwigs coats and laces and when captain ferrers returned the game began it was soon discovered that monsieur mornay had a great superiority in reach and he disarmed his elderly opponent immediately it was child's play almost before the baronet had taken his weapon in hand it flew to the ground again with this he lost his temper and throwing his seconds aside sprang upon the frenchman furiously a very myriad of lunges and thrusts flashed about m mornay and before the seconds knew what had happened the baronet seemed to rush upon the point of the frenchman's sword which passed into his body ferrers and cornbury ran forward and caught the wounded man in their arms while wynne seeing that he still breathed ran without further ado to the house in search of aid m mornay alone stood erect as cornbury rose to his feet the frenchman asked well clear through there's a hole on both sides you must be off they will be here presently and you i'll stay i can serve you better here and as mornay paused come there's no time to be lost he caught up the frenchman's coat hat and periwig and hurried down the garden towards the gate mornay cast a glance at the figure upon the ground and followed i mistrust ferrers whispered cornbury if he will but tell a decent story his grace may hush the matter if not eh bien i care not if not tis a case for the constables perhaps of the prison tis difficult to say a plea of chance medley a petition to the king mornay tossed his head impatiently as he replied i have nothing to expect from the king cornbury tush man all will be well but do ye not go to your lodgings meet me in an hour at the swan in fenchurch street and i'll tell ye the lay of the land go and waste no time where ye see the lantern of the watch with which he pushed the frenchman past the grilled door at the garden entrance and out into the street m mornay paused a moment while he slowly and carefully adjusted his coat cravat and periwig as he moved down the lane in the deep shadow of the high wall in the darkness and alone with his thoughts his poise and assurance fell from him like a doffed cloak his head drooped upon his breast as with shoulders bowed and laggard feet he walked in the throes of an overmastering misery he passed from the shadows of the walls of dorset gardens and out into the bright moonlight of the sleeping street had he wished to hide himself he could not have done so more effectually for in this guise he made rather the figure of a grief-ridden beldam than the fiery impulsive devil-may-care of the fleece tavern when he again reached the protecting shadow he sank upon a neighboring doorstep and buried his face in his knees the very picture of despair no sound escaped him it was the tumultuous silent man grief which burns and sears into the soul like hot iron but knows no saving relief in sob or tear once or twice the shoulders tremulously rose and fell and the arms strained and writhed around the upbent knees in an agony of self-restraint ten fifteen minutes he sat there lost to all sense of time or distance until his struggle was over then he raised his head and catching his breath sharply arose if 
there were but an end he sighed aloud constrainedly an end to it all then a bitter laugh broke from him it is true what she said was true i am a loathsome creature a thing a creeping thing that lives because it must because like a toad or a lizard it is too mean to kill there was a long silence at last he brushed his hand across his forehead and rose to his feet abruptly bah a bit of womanish folly he laughed tis some humor or sickness the plague is still in the air mordieu he shouted there is money to win and bright eyes to gleam for monsieur mornay i can laugh and jest still mes amis the closing of doors and the clatter of a coach upon the cobble surprised him into a sense of the present a footstep here and there and the sound of shouts close at hand recalled him to himself he saw from the garden gate of dorset house the flashing of a lantern and heard the shooting of the bolts and the rasp of a rough voice the spirit of self-preservation rose strong within him and put to rout every thought but flight he peered cautiously from his doorway and finding that the gate was not yet opened he went forth and hurried down the street and around the corner until all the sounds of pursuit were lost to hearing by the time m mornay had reached the swan in fenchurch street he was so far in possession of his senses that with a manner all his own he roused the master of the house from his bed and bade him set out a cold pate and two bottles of wine in the back room upstairs against the coming of the irishman nor had he long to wait for captain cornbury flushed and breathless soon burst into the room when he saw mornay his face relaxed in a look of relief egad ye hear he said twixt this and that i've had a thousand doubts about ye for the present then ye safe mornay pushed a bench toward him then ferrers has ferrers and dorset i faith between them they've raised the devil and captain ferrers by the ten holy fingers of the pope there was a fine notary spoiled when ferrers took service with the king for all the lion scoundrels he accused me egad he swore you were the head and foot of the whole business tonnerre de dieu and the duke i raged and swore to no purpose dorset believes ferrers is as you began it in the gallery the frenchman looked towards the ceiling with hands upraised the unfortunate politesse of m mornay the english i cannot understand ferrers swears it was a plot hatched in the fleece tavern and that i was a party to it mornay arose and grasped the irishman's shoulder you my poor friend you he exclaimed and i disarmed him twice it is too much let us go at once and face them cornbury pushed him down ye do not such thing to be arrant suicide the streets are full of men looking for you by this and me too they cannot you didn't even know tis true i'm dutch look ye man we're safe here and snug four-and-twenty lances couldn't get through tom boyle's downstairs if he'd set his mind to stop em rest a while and compose your mind besides he broke off abruptly and reached for the bottle give me a drink i can talk no more the words are all parching in my throat monet sank back upon his bench while the irishman filled and drained his cup at last he gave a great grunt of satisfaction and with smiling face set the vessel down upon the table with a clatter oh, on. talking is but a dry thread allons captain said mornay tell me all he drew the platter over and helped himself liberally from the pate 
well monsieur when i went back haywood was making a kind of statement to ferrers something in the nature of a dying confession it appears that this fellow haywood is a thieving rascal and if you killed him tis good riddance say i he paused a moment to pour his wine as you know he continued his mouth full as you know the man is a guardian of mistress barbara clark he has a disposition in the law of her fortune well from what he confesses tis not her fortune after all mornay's eyes opened wide with astonishment and interest he sat down upon the table untasted the cup he had raised to his lips and leaned intently forward is it true he exclaimed and mistress barbara has nothing nothing at all he broke into a hard dry little laugh pardieu twill lower her chin i'm thinking then his face clouded again go on monsieur he urged impatiently go on if i can remember it there's a bit of family history ye have not heard perhaps well ye must know that the chevalier brezac great-grandfather of this mistress clark bore a most intolerant hatred of spain and the spanish his son rene inherited this antipathy so when he married an english girl and settled in london he vowed that if any one of his three daughters married a spaniard he would cut her off with a louis he took a long draught of his wine here is where the confession begins the eldest daughter disobeyed and married a spaniard in paris she kept the marriage from her father and going to amiens and gave birth to a boy before she could summon courage to tell old brezac of her disobedience poor creature she died leaving an heir to the estate not so fast you see not a word of this was known in london nor is to-day at her death the bulk of the fortune went to the second daughter who was the mother of this mistress barbara the third daughter married haywood's uncle of this there was no issue but that's how the man came to be the guardian cornbury pulled a pipe from a rack and filled it now here's the villainy of the thing this spaniard came of gentle birth but oh fond was a sudden beast heywood went to paris as the envoy of wilfred clark barbara's father and after a shrewd bargain bought all the secret papers and evidence of this spanish marriage and the real heir as much alive as you are monsieur mornay contemplated the bottom of his bowl miltonnerre he growled tis the very refinement of perfidy the irishman drank deep a lucky stroke of yours mornay i say i would it had been mine what became of the papers that's why he would confessed i suppose you see he loved his ward and wanted ferrers to destroy them this he will do i'm thinking for he loves the lady himself and mistress clark hasn't a notion of it monet folded his arms and sat looking at the floor a strange smile upon his lips pardieu he said twould touch her pride twould wring her proud heart to have the heir come back to his own the bitterness of his tone caused cornbury to look at him in surprise oh there's never a chance of it he said you see this spaniard danyasco put the boy upon a ship why what ails you man what is it are you mad mornay had seized him by the arm with a grip of iron and leaned forward with eyes that stared at him like one possessed the name monsieur he said huskily the name the spanish name you said god man don't grip me so you've spilled the tobacco twas 
Tanyasco, I think, or Damasco, or some unspeakable thing. Think, man, think, cried Mornay passionately. Tis a matter of life and death. Was the name Luis Danyasco of Valencia? It was Cornbury's turn to be surprised. He looked at Mornay in amazement. If faith, now you mention it, I think it was. But how? And the name of the boy became Ruiz. The ship was the Castellano. Cornbury's eyes were wider than ever. It was. It was. Cornbury paused. Mornay had risen to his feet and stumbled to the dormer window, where he fell rather than leaned against the sill. The Irishman could see nothing but the upheave of the shoulders and the twitching of the hands as the man struggled for his self-control. Cornbury was devoured with curiosity, but with due respect for the Frenchman's silence sat smoking vigorously until Mornay chose to speak. As the Frenchman looked out at the quiet stars across the rooftops of London, he became calmer and at last turned around towards the flickering candles. Monsieur, began Cornbury with a touch of sympathy, but Mornay raised his hand in quiet protest. Danyasco was my father. Voilà tout, he said slowly and as the Irishman arose, Mornay continued, "'I can finish the story, Monsieur Cornbury,' he said lightly, but with a depth of meaning in his tone that did not escape the other. "'When the boy Ruiz grew old enough to know, the Spaniard told him that he had no mother, nor ever had.' that he was no woman's child. He put him on the Castellano and sent him out into the great world without a thought, without a blessing, without a name, the very shuttle and plaything of fortune. That child Cornbury was myself. The Irishman put his arm upon Monsieur Mornay's shoulder and clasped him by the hand. They stood thus a moment until Cornbury broke away, and with a shout that made the rafters ring, again filled the drinking bowls upon the table. A health, monsieur, he cried. You'll never drink a better. To the better fortunes of René d'Agnasco, the Comte de Brezac. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur waits upon a lady. Captain Cornbury was no fledgling. He was the younger son, none too highly esteemed by the elder branch of a hard-drinking, quick-fighting stock of ne'er-do-wells. He knew a trick with a sword, and for twenty years had kept a certain position by his readiness to use it. His last employment had been in the king's service as captain in a regiment of dragoons, but he lived, of a preference, upon his wits. There was never a game of dice or cards at which he could not hold his own at luck or skill skill at the fleece tavern too often meant dexterity in manipulation and where every man with whom he played took shrewd advantage of his neighbour there was little to cavil at but of late fortune had turned a wry face upon the man his regiment was disbanded for lack of money his pittance from the earl his brother ceased altogether and with a reckless manner of living, a debtor's prison stared him in the face. He sat upon the couch in Mornay's new room at the Swan Tavern, watching, with a somewhat scornful expression of countenance, Vigo help his master to make his toilet. His eyes blinked sleepily at the light, 
for it was high noon and his wig having been removed for comfort the light shone brilliantly upon a short crop of carroty red hair which took all the colors of the rainbow mornay wore a splendid silken nightgown little in keeping with the dinginess of the apartment while vigo dressed the master's peruke mornay told the irishman of the note from the king and of the arrival of the post from france with the news of the anger of the grand monarch and of his promise of death or imprisonment should mornay be brought to france cornbury pursed his lips in a thin whistle viscount he said frowning you're skating on thin ice mornay had completely recovered his good spirits he tossed his night-robe to vigo and snapped his fingers mais monsieur he smiled tis an exercise so exhilarating tenant man tis no time for jesting growled the irishman rising the post from france to-day says ye're to be put in the bastille or have your head chopped off in london ye're a fugitive from justice for killing and lastly your good friend charles has turned a cold shoulder on ye and ye talk of exhilaration cornbury's disgust was illimitable monet dusted a speck from his sleeve and smiled gaily it is not every day my good cornbury that a man may become possessed of a family a fortune and ma foi such a beautiful scornful she-cousin zons man how can you prove it without the papers the mere word danyasco will not open their ears or their hearts i believe it but who else would i can prove that i am the boy ruiz i tell you and you're fleeing for your life monet's face grew stern yes i am fleeing for my life he cried but they have not caught me yet last night i would not have cared if they had sent me back to france to-day it is different they have robbed me of my estates of my name they have made me a mere creeping thing a viper morbleu they shall feel the viper's sting monsieur de haywood is dead mistress barbara clark cornbury leaned forward in his chair surely you don't mean oh put your mind at rest mon ami i shall do my pretty cousin no violence i shall see her that's all but first first about the papers with this capitaine ferrer cornbury smiled dryly why you have but to poke a nose an inch beyond the door to be carted to the tower how will ye see captain farrers then tis the height of absurdity take my advice and keep close till ye find a ship then set your course for the plantations till your matter is cooled i've a debt or two myself and i'm inclined to accompany ye mornay looked at him in surprise why cornbury you have but a faint heart it is this news from france ye have no backing come have done cried mornay you sap my will if you cannot look the situation gallantly in the face why then he stopped and lowered his voice casting a glance at the irishman mon ami i expect too much more than i can claim mornay walked towards the door and took cornbury's cloak and hat allo you shall leave me at once your only danger is in my society go at once upon the street and they can prove nothing stay with me and you harbour an enemy of the state and a fugitive from justice 
cornbury threw a look at him and rose to his feet with an oath dang you man do you think i'd quit you now give me credit for a smallish sense of decency he walked to the window and looked down upon the street mornay followed him at once and took him by the hand i have offended you forgive me this matter is the turning of gall to honey for me cornbury i cannot leave it without a struggle i pray you bear with me cornbury was smiling in a moment what do you plan he said listen vigo is clever he shall discover for me when captain ferrers will wait upon madame ma cousine i too will call upon her and you've just killed her guardian said cornbury dryly she'll not receive you with kisses mornay smiled and slowly answered you will think it strange that a gentleman should intrude upon a woman but to-morrow perhaps to-day i may go from this city and country forever before that i shall make one effort to establish my good name i shall not succeed but i shall have done my duty to myself and the mother who bore me as for the captain ferrer monet's eyes flashed ominously if i knew where he had put the papers if i could but get him to fight fight ye couldn't coax a fight from ferrers with the flat of your hand he'd rather see in the bastille or the tower he's too sure to take any risks besides if you'd kill him the papers would be lost forever no he'll not fight he owes you money and while the constables can cancel the debt ye may be sure that he will not mornay passed his hand over his brow tis true but i must see them together that is the only chance i will go to-day but how mornay asked cornbury dryly in a coach and four mornay sprang to his feet in delight c'est ça he cried joyfully oh monsieur but you have the irish wit vigo shall bring me a coach i shall ride in state cornbury rose to his feet angrily what nonsense is this he cried mornay smiled on him benignly can you not see monsieur le capitaine why they are looking for me at the fleece in covent garden in the heaven inn or the hell tavern here will i be riding along the mall to the very place they would be least likely to look for me in my lady's boudoir cornbury at once saw the value of the plan but he never looked more sober and after he asked after replied mornay lightly after monsieur you leave too little to the imagination i think but of the present le bon dieu will provide for the future vigo was given his orders to make shrewd inquiries of the servants of the neighbors of mistress clark as to the hour of captain ferrer's daily visits he was also told to get a coach for monsieur he stood puzzled a moment monsieur wishes a hackney he asked a hackney no sirrah said mornay brusquely a pair then he asked scratching his head a pair roared mornay no sirrah for the marie i wish a coach and four twenty guineas at the very least if i wait upon madame at night a dozen links be off with you cornbury shook his head hopelessly you're going to your funeral in style he said mistress barbara sat alone looking out upon the quiet street while she looked she saw nothing and every line of her figure in abandonment to her mood 
spoke of sorrow and distraction her eyelids were red and the richly laced mouchoir which fell from the hand beneath her chin was moist with tears upon the tray were the dishes of a luncheon untouched and a number of papers some of them torn fell from her hand upon the floor a dish of roses a few french romances a manteau girdle a copy of the annus mirabilis of dryden a pair of scented gloves of marshall and a cittern in the corner completed the gently bred disorder of the room true sir henry hayward was no blood relation of hers and had only been her guardian a man of the world in the worst rather than the best sense there had been little in his life to appeal to her but he loved her in his own way and had been good to her in all matters that pertained to her estate and so she mourned him as one would mourn the loss of one whom nearness had made dear there was some bond which seemed to bind them more closely than their mere surface relations of ward and guardian an undercurrent of devotion and servitude which she felt though she could not understand the meaning his death wrung her mind if it did not wring her heart and by this fringeman there had been a moment or two of regret the other night that she should have used this mornay so cruelly a moment when the bitterness the grief the utter loneliness and longing she had seen in his face had filled her rebellious soul with compassion for his misery for she had a glimpse the very first of his pride overborne and beaten to earth in spite of its mighty struggle to rise but now now whatever regret had sprung into her heart whatever kindliness had been engulfed again in bitterness which cried out for justice while the woman in her had shrunk from the thought of him and wished him well away from london a sense of the fitness of things called for retribution for the wrong that had been done her and hers they had not caught him yet oh he was cunning and skilful that she knew but captain ferrers had assured her that to oblige louis of france the king had directed all the constables of london to be upon the watch for him it could not be long before they would have him fast behind the walls of the tower with god knows what in store for him there or at the bastille if he were taken back to france the bastille she shivered a little and put her kerchief over her face god forgive me she murmured if i have misjudged him there was a commotion below in the street the sound of galloping horses and the rumble of a fast-flying vehicle a plum-coloured calash with red wheels and splendid equipments was coming at a round pace up the street there were four sorrel horses a coachman footman and two outriders with a whirl of dust and the shouting of men the horses were thrown upon their haunches and the coach came to a stop directly before mistress barbara's door she peered out of the window curiously agape to know the identity of her visitor from the way in which he travelled abroad it must be a person of condition she felt assured a minister or a dignitary of the city come perhaps to beseech her influence there was a glimmer of bright colour in the sunlight a splendid figure periwigged and bonneted in the latest mode sprang out and to her front door she had barely time to withdraw her head before there was a knock and her lackey opened in some trepidation madame tis monsieur the vicomte de Brezac did i not give orders she began and then stopped to brissac to brissac what can it mean madam tis a matter of importance and a 
she stood debating whether she should call her governess or deny herself to her visitor but before she could do the one or the other footsteps came along the hallway and the lackey stepped aside as monsieur mornay entered mistress clark turned a pallid face towards him she stepped back a pace or two her hands upon her breast her eyes glowing with fear monsieur mornay turned to the lackey who still stood doubtful upon the threshold the look he gave the man sent him through the doorway and hall where the sound of his footsteps mingled with those of others without mistress clark cast a fleeting glance towards the boudoir but m mornay had taken his stand where he could command both entrances to the room she scorned to cry aloud for assistance nor would she risk his interference by trying to pass him he read her easily she made no motion to leave or speak to him but stood against the wall of the fireplace her muscles rigid and tense with fear and her eyes regarding him with all the calmness she could command madame he said solemnly looking out at her from under his dark brows before god i mean you no harm he said it as though it were a sacrament in half an hour or less i shall be gone from this room from your life for ever but you must hear what i have to say he paused no no madame it is not that which you suppose you need have no fear of me it is not that i swear it mistress barbara moved uneasily i pray that you will be seated madame no as you please what i have to say is not short shall i begin twas sooner over she said hoarsely he bowed politely i will endeavor to be brief many years ago your great-grandfather went to florida with the expedition of jean ribault perhaps you have been told of the massacre by the spanish and how the seigneur de brezac escaped to france merci you also doubtless know his and your grandfather's great hatred of the spanish people as the result of this massacre eh bien your grandfather told his three daughters one of whom was your mother that if one of them married a spaniard he would refuse her a part of his fortune and deny her as a child of his i pray you monsieur i crave your patience laurence your mother married monsieur clark and julie the younger sister married sir george maltby that is well known the elder sister was eloise his voice fell and the name was spoken with all the soft tenderness of the name itself perhaps you do not know madame that she too was married there was a mystery she muttered i heard then she stopped madame heard he asked politely but she was silent again eloise was married he continued while visiting at the chateau of the duc de nemours near paris to don luis d'agnasco who was a spaniard fearing her father's wrath and disinheritance this unfortunate woman concealed the facts of this marriage the record of which was the acknowledgment of the priest who married them and the statements of a nurse and another witness who had accompanied her to amiens wherein or about the year sixteen thirty five she gave birth to a son if mistress clark had allowed herself to relax a little before her interest now had dominated all feeling of fear and suspense 
she leaned a little forward breathless her hand upon the chair before her her eyes fixed upon the lips of the frenchman who spoke slowly concisely and held her with an almost irresistible fascination the saddest part of the story is to come madame the mother was grievously ill she suffered besides all the pangs of solitude at a time when a woman needs consolation and sympathy the most her mother had died her husband was worse than useless and she feared to let her father know the truth lest his stern and pitiless nature would wreak some terrible vengeance upon the spanish husband whom she still loved in spite of the fact that he had married her for her fortune and not for herself she had almost made up her mind to tell her father all when she died he paused a moment to give her the full import of his words and then looking at her steadily and somewhat sternly her son rene d'agnasco vicomte de brezac is still alive mistress barbara stood looking at him he met the look unflinchingly at last her eyes fell when she lifted them she did so suddenly and drew herself up at the same time all instinct with doubt and suspicion of this man who had first insulted then injured her and was now seeking to rob her of her birthright and you she asked bitterly her scorn giving wings to her fear and you can i believe you it was as though she had expressed her thought in words monsieur mornay felt the thrust but where the other night it could wound him mortally to-day it glanced harmlessly aside he still looked calmly at her and the least perceptible touch of irony played at the corners of his lips she mistook the smile for effrontery for the mere impudence of a man without caste who wrecks nothing for god nor man she flung her back towards him with a sudden gesture and turned towards the window you lie she said contemptuously monsieur mornay knit his brows and his eyes followed her angrily but he did not even take a step towards her his voice was as low as before when he spoke madame has a certain skill at hatred he said insults fall as readily from her lips as the petals from a flower he paused but they do not smell so sweet i do not lie madame he said with a gesture as though to brush the insult aside when he raised his voice it was with a tone and inflection of command which surprised and affrighted her she turned in alarm but he had not moved from his position near the door hear me you shall madame listen and rapidly forcefully masterfully even he told the story of the fate of the young d'agnasco called ruiz the perfidy of the drunken father in sending him away upon the ship castellano and the bargain by which his inheritance had been sold she heard him through because she could not help it but as he proceeded and the names of her father sir wilfred clark and sir henry hayward were mentioned she arose to her full height and with magnificent disdain threw fear to the winds and said coldly stop i have heard enough and with reckless mockery you monsieur i presume are rene d'agnasco vicomte de brezac monsieur mornay bowed the door of the room opened suddenly and captain ferrers entered a look of bewilderment was on his features as he glanced at mistress clark why barbara these men without what 
m mornay had turned his head and the flowing curls no longer hid his countenance i was expecting you captain ferrer said the frenchman ferrer stepped back a pace or two astonishment and consternation written upon his features had sir henry heywood come back to life the captain could not have been put into a greater quandary he looked at the frenchman and then at mistress clark for the solution of the enigma but mistress barbara had sunk upon the couch in an agony of fear a moment before she had prayed for this interruption now that it had come she was in a terror as to its consequences she made no reply but looked at the two men who stood a few feet apart with lowering looks the englishman flushed red with anger the frenchman cool impassive dangerous ferrers spoke first he stepped a pace or two towards the frenchman his brow gathered his shoulders forward menace in every line of his figure you have dared to force your way into this house the elbow was bent and the fist was clenched and an exclamation burst from mistress barbara who was gazing horror-struck at the impending brutality but the frenchman did not move the only sign of anything unusual in his appearance was the look in his eyes which met those of the englishman with an angry glitter of defiance if ferrers had meant personal violence to the frenchman he did not carry out his intentions he cast his eyes for a moment in the direction of mistress barbara and then drawing back again with a muttered exclamation made straight for the door before he could place his hand upon the knob mornay interposed one moment ferrer my men were told to let you in not to let you out and as ferrers paused a moment have patience monsieur le capitaine presently i will leave madame and you but first you must listen ferrers had grown white with rage and his hand had flown to his sword hilt he looked at the quiet figure of the frenchman and at mistress barbara whose eyes were staring at him wildly he bit his lip in chagrin and then struggled to control his voice your reckoning is not far distant monsieur mornay he said hoarsely if there is justice in england you shall hang this day week End of chapter four chapter five of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva indecision mornay waited while the englishman smothered his rage then with a sudden motion he brushed his kerchief across his temples as though to wipe the clouds from his forehead if madame will but bear with my brutality a little longer he smiled a little longer then she will have done with me forever the gesture and the air of contrition were rather racial than personal characteristics but as one sometimes will in times of great stress mistress barbara could not but compare mornay's ease and sang froid with the heavy and somewhat brutal bearing of captain ferrers she hated herself for the thought and as m mornay spoke turned her face resolutely to the window and away from him if madame will remember what i have had the honour to tell her she will now discover how monsieur ferrer becomes concerned he glanced at ferrers who stood to one side his arms folded his features sullen and heavy with the impotence of his wrath the frenchman was playing a desperate game with every chance against him to unmask the secret he must take 
the somewhat heavier englishman off his guard of one thing he felt sure ferrers knew little more as to the papers than did cornbury and himself he began abruptly without further preface madame has just learned from my lips of certain matters monsieur le capitaine which bear strongly upon her interests in the estate of brezac she has yet to learn how much a part of it all you have become she has been told of the fortunes of eloise d'agnasco and of the rightful heir to the estates what she wishes most to learn is the contents and purport of the papers in your possession monet had spoken slowly to give force to his words and the effect of his information upon ferrers was remarkable the lowering crook came out of his brows and his hand made an involuntary movement to his breast the fingers trembling a moment in the air his face relaxed like heated wax and he stared at the frenchman his mouth open the picture of wonderment and uncertainty mistress clark who had been about to speak paused bewildered ferris stammered awkwardly as though gathering his wits for a reply the papers he gasped at last the papers and then with a futile attempt at sang froid what papers monsieur if the englishman had not been so completely off his guard he would have seen a flash of triumph in the frenchman's eyes monet narrowly watched his discomfiture then continued quietly monsieur le capitaine ferrer rene d'agnasco has been found the son of eloise de brezac has come to life and is to-day in london he knows of the sale of his birthright he has discovered the proofs of his mother's marriage and of his birth at amiens he but awaits a favourable opportunity to bring the matter before a court by this time captain ferrers had recovered a certain poise he swaggered over to the mantel where he turned to mistress clark a fine tale he sneered a pretty air mistress barbara to send a hunted man as his ambassador then the presence of cornbury at the dying confession came to his memory and the situation dawned upon him for the first time he laughed aloud with real blatant merriment i see he cried it is you you monet the outcast monet the broken gambler the man without a creed or country who is now become the vicomte de brisac it is necromancy worthy of dr bendo he was firm upon his feet again the very absurdity of the claim had restored his heavy balance somewhat disturbed by the announcement of his possession of the papers he turned to mistress clark and found her eyes full of wonder and inquiry still turned upon him she was sensible of an influence which the frenchman's words had wrought and felt rather than saw the surprise and alarm which underlay the somewhat blustery demeanour of captain ferrers during the denouement not a word had passed her lips when she had tried to speak it seemed as though she had been deprived of the power she sat looking from the one to the other fear and doubt alternating in her mind as to the intentions of the frenchman what did it all mean captain ferrers at the best of times was not a man who could conceal his feelings but why had he lost countenance so at the mention of the papers why had he not done something at the first 
that would prove the frenchman the cheat and impostor that he was why did the irony of his words fall so lightly upon the ears of monsieur mornay that he seemed not even to hear them why were the frenchman's eyes so serious so steady so clear to return her gaze with an effort she slowly arose struggling against she knew not what something which seemed to oppress her and threaten the freedom of her speech and will a feeling that she had allowed herself if even only for a moment to be influenced against her better judgment filled her with resentment against this man who had broken past her barriers again and again and now offended not only the laws of society but the laws of decency by brutally pushing past her servants and holding her against her will a prisoner in her own apartments as she stood upon her feet she regained her composure and when she spoke her voice rang with a fearlessness that surprised even herself it was the exuberance and immoderation of fear the sending of the pendulum to the other end of its swing for shame sir to make war upon a woman is there not left a spark of the gallantry of your race that you should break into a woman's house like a cutpurse a common pirate and outlaw have you no pride of manhood left no honour no respect for the sanctity of the sex that bore you would you oppress and hold a helpless woman in restraint monsieur you are a coward a coward i repeat for the last time i do not believe you i would not believe you if you gave me your oath ferris said nothing but the curl of his lips told the volume of his pleasure they were dreadful words to mornay but he looked at her with a calmness that gave no sign of hidden discomfiture his eyes did not drop under her lashing sneers instead as she paused he began speaking with a quiet insistence in which there was the least touch of patronage madame hear me out i pray you i have come brutally into your house i have been the bully with you and yours i have held you prisoner to ask your pardon would be still further to insult you but i leave london to-night and as ferrers interposed he raised his hand pardon monsieur a moment and i have done i leave london to-night and i shall not trouble you more thank god for that she said bitterly mornay continued as though he did not hear her i have broken in upon you because it was the only way that i could see you the only way that i could tell you what i had to say that i have sinned is because well because i had hoped that after all madame perhaps the blood could flow warmly from your heart he tossed his chin defiantly you have scorned me for one who bears false witness though you have seen your english captain go pale at the mention of those papers you will believe what he says and scorn me in whom runs the blood of the same grandparents as yourself you have looked upon me as an impostor eh bien think what you will impostor i am not he drew himself up and said clearly in a full measure of pride and dignity i am rene d'agnasco vicomte de brezac he moved to the door looking not at her or even noticing the contemptuous laugh of captain ferrers then slowly i leave you madame to-morrow i will be but a memory an evil dream which soon passes away 
you have chosen to be my enemy and to send me away from you in scorn hatred and disbelief let it be so but remember madame when i am gone every pretty sweetmeat you put in your mouth every dainty frock you put upon your back every slipper every glove every ring and spangle that you wear is mine all mine she shrank back with horror at the thought and ferrers broke in with an illy suppressed oath one moment sirrah he cried if the play-acting's done i'd have a word with you will you permit mistress clark to withdraw monet took his hand from the knob of the door and turned while a gleam of satisfaction crossed his features in that look mistress barbara read a sinister intention she thrust herself before captain ferris no no she cried you shall not there shall be no more no more blood shedding captain ferris let the man go let him go i tell you let him go as you love me let him go captain ferris disengaged her arms from about his shoulders while mornay watched them half amused half satirical fear nothing from him madame he interrupted dryly there will be no fight with capitaine ferrer tis only a touch of irritation and will speedily pass when i am gone he opened the door and called into the hall vigo the coach but captain ferrers had put mistress clark aside you must go he cried furiously almost jostling the shoulder of the frenchman tush monsieur said mornay sternly you forget yourself i will be at the fleece tavern to-night at eleven if you would see me before i leave england you will find me there madame your servitor in a moment he had closed the door and was walking down the hallway monsieur mornay knew that ferrers would lose but little time in arousing the servants of mistress clark and that before he should have gone very far upon his way there would be a hue and cry after him but he had great confidence in vigo and the coachman and outriders were rogues with comfortable consciences who if they were well paid could be depended upon he entered the coach and waved his hand the coachman snapped his lash over the heads of the leaders the fire flew from the cobbles as the animals clattered into a stride the vehicle had not moved its own length before ferrers and two lackeys came running out of the house shouting at the top of their bent but vigo had his instructions the lash came down again and the horses broke into a brisk trot one of the lackeys sprang for the bridle of the nearest outrider but the horseman gave the man a cut across the face with his whip and he fell back with a scream of pain ferrers was absolutely helpless there were not half a dozen people in the street monsieur mornay thrust his head out of the window of the coach and took off his hat the fleece tavern at eleven he said ferrers hurled a curse at him and renewed his shouting to the end that men by this time came running from the houses and shops farther up the street through which the coach must pass but the horses were moving at a full gallop it would have been easier to stop a charge of cavalry most people simply looked back at ferrers and stared one or two venturesome fellows rushed out but a sight of the resolute faces of the outriders who guarded the leaders heads was enough to make them pause and the coach clattered on to safety there were twenty plum-coloured calashes in the city and mornay knew that detection would be difficult if not impossible at this time of the evening when the streets were cleared and the coach could wind deviously to the distant purlieus of finchurch street 
soon the clamour they had made was lost in the turns of the winding streets and the coach was brought by a distant route to the spot where m mornay had entered it not a stone's throw from the swan cornbury was awaiting him upstairs he had puffed the room full of smoke and a look of relief passed over his face as mornay entered well monsieur he asked mornay did not answer he tossed his hat down and threw himself into a chair i've lost he muttered at last he said no more and cornbury did not press him for information but presently when the supper was brought and his eye alighted upon the face of his servant he broke into a smile ah vigo he cried did my honest rogues uh, get back to their stable in perfect safety monsieur scaldy queen and tom trice are not the ones to be caught napping they only wish another venture in your service monet sadly shook his head vigo i shall need no further service in england you too shall go back to france and i he paused as a sudden thought came to him he brought his fist down upon the table parbleu wait we go perhaps we may yet have need for these fellows tell them to come here quietly by ten of the clock cornbury had been watching him narrowly now he broke out angrily can ye not be satisfied why must ye go for ever risking your neck in the noose ye've escaped this time how god knows save by that presumption which ye wear as a garment come now i've made up my mind to go to the plantations take ship with me man i know of a venture there that is worth the pains of the trouble twenty times over come at least for the present until your peril is grown less mornay was holding his chin in his hand lost in thought mon ami he said at last i've shot my bolt and lost there was never so heartless a maid since the world began tush dear man must ye be forever thinking of the girl a winch is a winch in england or america mornay arose and put his hands frankly upon the other's shoulders i'll go with you my good friend where you please after to-night ay and to-night ye may go to the devil tis so i have an appointment with captain ferrers at the fleece for eleven cornbury's face fell gad man you're incorrigible and do you think he'll meet you i don't know he may not alone but i think that he will in company if he does i'll not fail him don't you go it will be a trap the man will not fight i tell you while the law of england can do his vengeance for him you run afoul of an army of constables i know it but i'll risk it and if you kill him you destroy the last proof of your birth sneered the irishman i don't know replied mornay coolly cornbury stormed up and down the room in a rage ye'll have your will he cried for the sake of a little fight go to your death rash man that ye are but don't say that i haven't warned ye cornbury listen i've a desire to look into the pockets of this capitaine ferrer and what do you think you'll find there the blessing of the pope mornay laughed outright perhaps but not for me an idea has grown upon me and now possesses me body and soul it is that these papers are in the coat of monsieur ferrer cornbury sent out a sudden volume of smoke to signify his disgust Psh! do you think the man has but one suit you lose your labor sir he has hidden your proofs most secretly by this none the less mon ami i'm going to pick his pocket 
there was a thin skim of storm over the face of the moon as mornay and cornbury left the swan tavern the wind was fitful in the streets and though the season was june as they passed a corner now and then a heavy gust full of the dampness and rigor of october flew full in their faces and caused them to pull their summer cloaks more closely about them following in their footsteps were three men one of whom was vigo the other two were the rascals who had served as outriders to monsieur mornay in the afternoon tom trice a tall and slender stoop-shouldered man who peered uneasily to left and right and scaldy quinn who was short with a most generous breadth of leg and shoulder the frenchman had paid them liberally before leaving the swan and the understanding was that they should follow instructions without question and if necessary be prepared to strike a sturdy blow or two for monsieur who was going into the camp of his enemies the fleece tavern had lately gained a bad name by reason of the many brawls and homicides that had occurred within its walls the place was not inaptly named for its master papworth took money when and how he might and bore the name of one who would not stop at a sinister deed if it would avail him to achieve his end but in spite of its disrepute among the more careful of its gamesters at the court the fleece was still frequented by a larger following than any other gaming-house in london there was more money to be seen there more of its rooms were filled at all hours with a motley crowd of men of the town noblemen and soldiers of fortune who would play at dice basset and quince for days and nights at a time dropping out only when the lack of food and sleep made it necessary cornbury strode along muttering in his cloak why go on this d d fool's errand he said at last why will ye not take ship comfortably like a gentleman like ye the look of a prison that ye must be prying and poking your head inside the bars you're a fool man mornay paused to look at him curiously for a moment and then he laughed i am and you're another mon ami for going with me they walked along for a moment in silence before the frenchman spoke again here is what we shall do cornbury we go shall go into the house next to the fleece which is upon the corner it is a mercer's shop with lodgings above to let he will choose a room and so gain his way to the roof he will then steal over the leads to the dormer of the fleece and down into the hall making all clear for our escape the other two rascals will enter by the cook room and gaining their way upstairs await our signal there we will then meet Capitaine ferrer and his friend with an eye in the back of our heads for any signs of his followers as mornay proceeded he could see the eyes of the irishman flash with delight in the moonlight tis a good plan he returned and but for one thing what they may be too many for you ferrers will have half of the watch with him for by this there's a pretty premium upon your head the more credit then in outwitting them and then sinking his voice silence monsieur we are already in the shadow of st paul's end of chapter five Chapter Six of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. The Escape. They walked quickly along under a wall, keeping in the shadow. Vigot received his orders and went forward alone, 
when last they saw him he was swaggering and staggering by turns up to the mercers where he began pounding lustily upon the door for admittance trice and quinn mornay dispatched by a side street to approach the tavern from another direction at the fleece there was no unusual sign from an open window came the rattle of dice the clink of the counters and the laughter of men the night being still young many people were passing to and fro upon the streets and mornay and cornbury wrapped in their cloaks looking neither to the right nor left pushed open the door at the front and walked boldly into the room several drinkers lounged upon the benches and there was a game of basset in the corner but the players were so intent that they had no eyes for the new arrivals cornbury drummed loudly upon the floor with his foot and one of the fellows a pigeon-breasted ensign in a dragoon regiment cast a loser's curse over his shoulder but failed to recognize them they ordered a drink and the room on the second floor at the head of the stairway mornay's reasons for this were obvious he wanted a narrow passage where more than two men would be at a disadvantage and where all opportunity for outside interference would be obviated the host himself brought their lights and bottles when he saw that it was monsieur mornay who was his guest he started back in amazement monsieur he cried you i thought Shh, yes it is i but keep your tongue papworth is captain ferrers here no sir two notes have arrived for him but mornay glanced significantly at the irishman you think he will come i should be sure of it sir very good when he comes tell him captain cornbury and i are awaiting him but sir if you'll pardon me the fleece tavern is no place for you sir there's been constables watching for you all yesterday and to-day mornay laughed a little to himself tis plain i am too popular listen papworth i did you a good turn with the king when captain lyall was killed in your garden now you can return me the compliment yes monsieur but i'll have no refusal the man rubbed his chin dubiously while cornbury told him their plans when the irishman had finished Monet slipped a handful of coins into his palm, which worked a transformation in his point of view. I'll do what I can, monsieur, he said, jingling the money. But if there's to be fighting, the fleece will lose its good repute for ever. Monet and Cornbury both laughed at the long face and hollow note of virtuous regretfulness and resignation in his voice. Oh, on if there's ever been a duel in your garden once in forty years i'd never be the man to suspect it said the irishman the landlord raised a deprecating hand and disappeared the garden growled mornay i hope it may not be necessary to carry this matter there but have you thought he may not come up to your room he must there was a cautious knock at the door and vigo entered despair and distress written upon his features monsieur ill news there was no room to let at the mercers to-morrow is market day and the house is full to the garret he would not let me even inside the door tonnerre de dieu and worse yet monsieur this place is watched a number of black silent figures are regarding it from the shadows you have read the man aright mornay said cornbury mille diables we must go by the roof it is our only chance listen vigo do you go upstairs and out upon the leads curse the fellow if you cannot get into his house at the bottom you must get in at the top 
vigot was off again as the landlord entered monsieur mornay captain ferrers awaits you below a quick glance passed between the two men mornay paused a moment before replying tell him papworth he said coolly that monsieur mornay has a quiet room upstairs where matters can be privately discussed i will await him here the man departed cornbury drained his bowl the man's an arrant coward ten guineas that he doesn't come up why monsieur he couldn't have entrapped us better himself you've made the bait too tempting he'll smell a rat poof cornbury he has it all his own way twenty guineas that he comes cornbury did not answer he was bending towards the door his mouth and eyes agape as though to make his hearing better but only the clatter of the game and the sound of the coarsened and voices of the players came up the dimly lighted stairway upon the coming of this man hung mornay's only chance for success five minutes they waited in silence but at last there was a sound of footsteps upon the stairs and in a moment captain ferrers and mr wynne stood before them the exuberance and confidence of captain ferrers smile found no echo in the face of wynne who looked sullenly and suspiciously at cornbury and the frenchman as though the adventure were little to his liking mornay arose from his bench with great politeness the perfection of courtesy and good will and waved captain ferrers to a seat cornbury sat puffing volumes of smoke with an appearance of great contentment and unconcern captain ferrers was clearly taken off his guard and his smile became the broader he had at first thought monsieur mornay's promise to come to the fleece a mere french flippancy surely after what had happened he could expect no clemency from ferrers monsieur mornay would have been flattered had he known how much of captain ferrers thoughts he had occupied during the last few hours the frenchman's demeanour in the house of mistress clark his earnestness his self-confidence his assurance and poise outdid anything that ferrers remembered of that presumptuous person a man with one leg in the grave or a lifetime of imprisonment staring him in the face would only play such a part because of one or two circumstances he was using a desperate resort to gain some great end perhaps to influence mistress barbara for clemency in the case of the death of sir henry haywood or else he was the real heir of the estate which mistress barbara was enjoying to tell the truth ferrers did not care what he was if the frenchman came to the fleece tavern he would be in the tower by midnight the prison would know no distinctions he hated this man as one hates another to whom he is under obligations and who has done him a great injury and if he was the real heir come to dispossess mistress barbara and balk him in the marriage that meant a fortune beyond the wildest dreams the worse for him he should suffer for it all of these things passed again somewhat heavily through his mind the air of unconcern and assurance which he met in the faces of both mornay and the irishman disarmed him he thought how easy it had been to gain his ends and comfortably fingered the whistle in his pocket with which he should presently call in his hounds upon his enemy nor would his pistols be required if he had wished he could have sent his constables up from below to take these men in the trap they had made for themselves but he enjoyed the situation it was as easy as a game of quince with the mirror behind your opponent's back monsieur ferrer began mornay pleasantly i am meeting you to-night at great risk of my life i thank you that you 
have kept my plans and this rendezvous a secret ferrer's small eyes blinked as though they had been liberally peppered but the smile did not disappear what i have to say is to your great advantage if after i am through you still wish to meet me i shall be at your service below in the garden or elsewhere will you sit down the captain's lip twitched a little and his fingers left the whistle and moved to a chair back it was apparent that mornay's mind was a thousand miles from all thought of distrust or suspicion he was as guileless as a child cornbury had filled another pipe and crossed his legs it will be useless to sit or talk monsieur said ferrers coldly i have brought mr wynne with an object which cannot be mistaken if you are agreeable mr wynne will talk with captain cornbury as to the arrangements he folded his arms and walked to the window with an air of rounding off a conversation mornay arose from his seat and walked around the table to the side nearest the door you must hear me monsieur he said calmly i offer you friendship and a proposition which cannot but be to your advantage ferrers had turned but his head shook in refusal there can be but one proposition between us mornay mornay shrugged his shoulders captain cornbury he said will you have the kindness to arrange with monsieur de Wynne? he stopped bit his lip a moment then turned to ferrers once more i entreat you to listen to me i have told you that i was the vicomte de brezac no it is no jest i am rene d'agnasco eh bien one day i shall prove it what i ask is only to save a little time he moved nearer to the englishman until he could have touched him with his outstretched arm listen monsieur if you will but give me the papers there was a motion if ever so slight of the fingers of ferrer's right hand only mornay saw it but it was enough he sprang forward upon the man and ferrer's whistle never reached his lips in his wish to give the alarm he did not attempt to draw his firearm until mornay's hands and arms had pinioned him like a vice all the fury of a life of longing was in that grasp it seemed as though the years of sweat and privation had wrought upon his will and energy for this particular moment he bore the englishman back until his head struck the wall and they came to the floor together at the first sign of trouble wynne had started for the door but cornbury was there ahead of him not until then had there been a word spoken a cry uttered but now almost at the same instant that mornay and ferrers crashed to the floor wynne set up a loud cry which resounded down the corridor and stairs in a moment there was a sound of tumbling furniture and the cries of men seemed to come from every part of the building but vigo and his two fellows from above were first upon the landing and set so vigorously upon the men mounting the stairs that their ascent was halted and they were thrown back in confusion in the meanwhile the struggle between mornay and ferrers continued the englishman had found his voice and between his cries and curses and the clashing of the steel of cornbury and wynne the room was now a very bedlam of sound either the blow of his head at the wall or the sudden fury of mornay's assault had given the frenchman the advantage for ferrers lay prone upon the floor and though he shouted and struggled both of his wrists were held helpless in one of mornay's sinewy hands suddenly monsieur mornay sprang away from the englishman and to his feet waving in his hands a packet of papers he rushed past cornbury and went to the table 
his eyes gleaming with excitement with a fascination which made him oblivious to everything but his one overmastering passion he tore the cover from the packet and examined the papers in the glare of the candles in one of them he saw the name danyasco it was enough none but a desperate man would have done so foolhardy a thing at such a time captain ferrers was not slow to take advantage of his opportunity he struggled painfully to his knee and drawing his pistol took a careful aim and fired at the frenchman monet's wig twitched and fell off among the candles he staggered forward and dropped like a drunken man his elbows on the table ferrers reached his feet and drawing his sword made for the door but mornay was only stunned vigo vigo he shouted rising prenez garde vigo but before vigo could turn captain ferrers had rushed out and thrust the unfortunate servant through the back as mornay saw vigo go down he sprang after the englishman into the corridor ferrers had set upon one of the fellows in the passageway at the same time that another and more determined attack was made from below for a moment it seemed as though the constables had gained the landing they would have done so had not mornay with an incomparable swiftness engaged ferrers and driven him step by step to the stairs where at last he fell back and down into the arms of the men below at this moment cornbury having disabled wynne came running to mornay's assistance with two heavy benches which were thrown down the stairs into the thick of the men below so that they fell back groaning and bruised to the foot of the stairway then without the pause of a moment mornay dashed out the lights and carrying vigo ordered a retreat up the second flight of steps vigo had a mortal wound and was even then at the point of death monsieur he said faintly c'est fini laissez moi there were some heavy chests of drawers in the corridor above and mornay directed that these be piled for a barricade the stairway was here very narrow and but one man could come up at a time so two chests were balanced on the incline of the stairs and two more were ready at the top to replace the others when this was done mornay sent quinn and trice up to the next floor to gain the roof and find a way to the street when they were gone mornay leaned over the dying man upon the floor my poor vigo he said laissez-moi monsieur whispered vigo c'est fini they cannot hurt me over the roof a window is open into the garret of the mercers go but quickly monsieur quickly mornay tried to lift him but a deep groan broke from his breast no monsieur no mornay and cornbury lifted him and placing him on a bed in one of the rooms quietly closed the door by this time the men below had reached the landing mornay had one advantage while the movements of the figures below were plainly to be seen there was no light above and the frenchman knew that the constables could not tell whether his party were one or six it was plain that they did not relish an attack on the dark stairway if they had not been able to gain the landing below how could they expect to fare better here they caught a glimpse of the dim outline of the chests of the barricade but beyond that all was black and forbidding mornay and cornbury only waited long enough to give the fellows above a chance to get over the roof when they too quickly followed as they crawled out of the window they heard the voice of ferrers cursing the men for laggards and at last a clatter of feet and the fall of one of the chests down the stairs they made their way stealthily but quickly across the leads to the dormer window of the mercer's shop where they saw trice beckoning with a last backward glance they stole into the room its inmate was sitting upright in bed quinn was binding and gagging him with a kerchief and a sheet 
they shut the window and took the key from the door and passing into the hallway locked their man in his room it was none too soon for a sound of shouts above announced that their escape was discovered upon this cornbury threw discretion to the winds and with drawn sword went down the stairs three steps at a time the rickety stairs swayed and groaned under this noisy invasion doors opened and night-capped heads with frightened faces peered from narrow doorways there was a lantern burning in a sconce upon the wall this mornay seized as he passed at the head of the first flight the mercer came out but cornbury stuck him in the leg with the point of his sword and seizing him by the back of the neck pushed and dragged him down the stairs the way out ye vermin he said quick no not the front the back door the man was sallow with terror the b back door he chattered that th there is no back door a window then jerked out cornbury quick there was a warning prod of the sword the man cried out but staggered through the mercer's shop into a passage mornay and cornbury thrust ahead of him which way they cried in unison he indicated a window when it was opened they saw it was not six feet from the ground by this time the whole neighborhood was aroused and cries and shouts resounded in all quarters mornay had put the light out and pausing not a moment stepped over the sill and let himself down into a kind of roofed alley or court which ran between the rear portions of the buildings while mornay covered the landlord to keep him silent cornbury and the others quickly followed without waiting a moment the four men gathered themselves into a compact body and dashed down the alley as fast as they could run it was a case now for speed and stout blows there was a turn in the alley before it reached the street it was on rounding this that they came full into the midst of a party of men who were running in to meet them the surprise was mutual all the commotion had been on the roof and in the main street and there was so much noise that the constables had not even heard the footfalls around the corner but mornay's men had the advantage of being on the offensive there was a hurried discharge of firearms and a shout broke from bill quinn but he kept on running cornbury fired his pistol at one man and then threw the weapon full at another who cut at him with a pike in a moment they were through and in the street a scattering of shots sent the dust and stones flying from a wall beside them but the moon was gone and aim was uncertain the shouting had increased and the sound of footfalls was just behind which way said mornay straight ahead replied cornbury to the river afterwards our chances with a boat are best they turned into a dark street and trice who was slender and nimble-footed led the way into the darkness with the speed of a deer he wound in and out of alleys and narrow streets where the shadows were deeper closely followed by mornay and cornbury the pace was so rapid that quinn was nearly spent seeing that if he were not heartened he would be taken mornay slackened and came back beside him as he glanced around he saw that two men were approaching rapidly not a hundred yards away there's nothing for it panted cornbury if i had a pistol i could wing the man in front mornay drew his own from his pocket and handed it to him cornbury leaned against a wall and carefully fired with a shout the man clapped his hand to his leg he hobbled a few paces and then fell head over heels into the gutter with singular discretion the other man slackened his speed and stopped to await his fellows who were coming up in a body not far behind tom trice had disappeared but the river was not far distant cornbury saw the shimmer of it and said so to poor quinn this plucked up his courage and 
with a hand at either arm he managed to make so good a progress that they had crossed the wide docks and tumbled into a boat before the first of their pursuers had emerged from the darkness quinn fell like a gasping fish under the thwarts but cornbury and mornay pulled at the oars with such vigour that before a single black figure appeared upon the coping of the dock they had put fifty feet of water between themselves and the shore there was a splash of light and another and the bullets spat viciously around them but they kept on pulling and made the lee of a barge not far away in safety when they heard the constables clatter down into one of the boats they took off their doublets and pulled for their lives the tide was running out and they shot the bridge like an arrow but they could see the black mass of the boat of their pursuers as it stole like some huge black bug from the inky reflection into the grey of the open water there was a patch of light under the bows and the frequent glamour of the wind-swept sky upon the oars was far too rapid and steady for their comfort a fellow stood up in the stern giving the word for the oarsmen and hard as the fugitives pulled the boat gained steadily upon them bill quinn was useless and even had he been able to row there were only two pairs of oars so they set him to loading the pistols while they cast their eyes over their shoulders in search of a place of refuge they knew if they made immediately for the shore they would fall too probably into the hands of the watch for the streets here were wider and there were fewer places for concealment than in the thickly settled part of the city which they had left their course was set directly across the bows of a large vessel getting under way the anchor had clanked up to the bows and there was a creak of halyard and sheet block as her canvases took the wind a clamour of hoarse orders mingled with oaths and the sound of a maudlin singing but the boat of the constables was every moment splashing nearer and nearer and mornay seeing escape by this means impossible determined to lay aboard the ship and take his chances accordingly they stopped rowing and waited until the vessel should gather way enough to come up with them when the black boatload of men saw this they gave a cheer for they thought themselves certain of their game for answer there was a volley from three pistols which sent one man into the bottom of the boat so that the oars upon one side caught so badly in the water that the boat slewed around from her course and lost her way in the water at the sound of the shots a dozen heads appeared in the bows of the ship which was coming up rapidly what all there yelled a heavy voice out of way or i run you down cornbury and quinn arose to their feet but mornay sat at his oars keeping the boat broadside to the approaching vessel jump before she strikes man the four chains and split sail rigging the huge fabric loomed like a pall upon the sky and they could see two long lines of foam springing away from the forefoot which was coming nearer nearer look alive there shouted the gruff voice again there was a grinding crash as cornbury and quinn sprang for the rigging quinn struck his head upon a steel stay and had not the strength to haul himself clear of the water with a cry he fell back into the submerged boat mornay waited a moment too long and the vessel struck him fairly in the body he too fell back into the water but as he was tossed aside he fell as by a miracle into the friendly arms of the anchor which not having been hauled clear dragged just at the surface of the water with an effort he pulled himself up and at last climbed upon the stock and so to the deck unharmed a cluster of dark faces surrounded him and a short broad man with a black beard and rings in his ears thrust his way through he looked at the shivering and dripping figures before him with a laugh so ho 
just in the very nick of the hookation my bullies eh be three beauties ha ha jailbirds at a guinea a head there was a sound of cries and the clatter of oars but the vessel was moving rapidly through the water and the constables were rapidly left to stand in the king's name shouted the voice of captain ferrers let me aboard the man with the black beard ran aft and leaned over the rail towards the boat which was struggling in the water and who might you be he roared i represent the law cried ferrers and his voice seemed dimmer in the distance these men are officers of the king to arrest the remainder of the sentence was caught in the winds and blown away the black-bearded man slapped his leg the law the law he shouted then he made a trumpet of his hands to make his meaning clear and roared go to hell he clapped his hand to his thigh and laughed immoderately monsieur mornay who had been looking aft over the bulwarks saw the figure of ferrers stand up in the stern sheets and shake his fist at the vessel then the boat pulled around to the half-sunken craft which the fugitives had abandoned all in dark shadow they saw quinn pulled out of the water by the constables and then the figures leaned over again and lifted something out of the water and passed it to the figure in the stern the frenchman took cornbury wildly by the arm god god he cried my doublet the papers were in my doublet he put a hand upon the rail and would have jumped into the water if cornbury had not seized him and held him until the fit was past end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Barbara. After Monsieur Mornay's coach had rumbled away, Mistress Barbara excused herself to Captain Ferrers and threw herself upon her couch in poignant distress and indecision. Why she had hated this Monsieur Mornay so she could not for her life have told herself perhaps it was that she had begun by hating him but now when he had killed her friend and counsellor and had used violent means to approach and coerce her now when she had every right and reason for hating him she made the sudden discovery that she did not the shock of it came over her like the sight of her disordered countenance in the mirror the instinct and habit of defence amplified by a nameless apprehension in the presence of the man had excited her imagination so that she had been willing to believe anything of him in order to justify her conscience for her cruelty but now that he was gone in all probability to the gallows and she was no longer harassed by the thought of his presence she underwent a strange revulsion of feeling she knew it was not pity she felt for him it would be hard she thought to speak of pity and m mornay in the same breath it was something else something that put her pride at odds with her conscience her mind at odds with her heart she lay upon the couch dry-eyed clasping and unclasping her hands what was he to her that she should give him the high dignity of a thought why should the coming or the going of such a man as he scapegrace gambler duelist and now fugitive from justice make the difference of a jot to a woman who had the proudest in england at her feet fugitive from justice ah god why were men such fools here was a brave man scapegrace and gambler if you like 
but gallant sailor soldier and chevalier of france a favorite of fortune who through that law of nature by which men rise or sink to their own level had achieved a position in which he consorted with kings dukes and princes of the realm and boasted of a king for an intimate in a moment he had rendered at naught the struggles of years had tossed aside as one would discard a worn-out hat or glove all chances of future preferment in france and england all for a foolish whim for a pair of silly grey eyes she hid her face in her arms fools all fools she hated herself that she did not hate m mornay struggle as she would now that he was gone she knew that the impulsive words that she had used when she had spurned him had sprung from no origin of thought or reflection but were the rebellious utterings of anger at his intrusion of resentment and uncharity at the tale he told but what if it were true she sat upright and with a struggle tried dispassionately and calmly to go over one by one each word of his speech each incident of his bearing as he told his portentous story of the secrets of her family how had m mornay come into possession of all this information she knew that eloise de brezac had died in france and that the duke of nemours had sent the body to be buried on the estates in normandy where it lay in the family tomb she knew that sir henry haywood's intimacy with the duke was of long standing and that there was a mystery in regard to the death of this daughter of the house which had never been explained to her her grandfather had been ill at the time she remembered and had died before sir henry hayward and her father who had gone to france had returned the story of the frenchman tallied strangely with the facts as she knew them how did mornay know of the unfortunate woman's death at amiens was the story of the spaniard danyasco invented to comport with the family's traditionary hatred of the spanish were the names castellano of the ship and ruiz of the boy mere fabrications to achieve an end how did he know these things the family history of the brezacs was not an open book to all the world no one but sir henry Haywood and herself had known of the visits to Paris and the death place of Eloise. And Captain Ferrers, how could she explain his loss of countenance when the tale was told? What papers were these, the very mention of which could deprive him of his self-possession? And what reason had he for keeping papers referring to her estate from her knowledge? They were matters which put her mind upon a rack of indecision she should know and at once the frenchman had planned well he had proved that captain ferrers was concealing something from her of this she was confident although in her discovery she had scorned to show mornay that she believed him in anything if sir henry haywood had entrusted matters pertaining to the estate to captain ferrers she was resolved that she should know what they were she judged from his actions that captain ferrers had reasons for wishing these papers kept from her she therefore resolved to learn what they contained if he would not give them to her and this she thought possible she would meet him in a different spirit and try with art and diplomacy what she might not accomplish by straightforward means what if mornay's tale were true she asked herself again what if these papers were the secret proofs of the marriage of eloise de brezac with the birth of a son and heir to the estates in accordance with her grandfather's will what if m mornay could prove that he 
was ruiz son of danasco and had sailed from valencia upon the castellano in the cool light of her reasoning it did not seem impossible she recalled the face of monsieur mornay and read him again to herself it seemed as though every expression and modulation of his voice had been burned upon her memory had he flinched had he quivered an eyelash had he not borne the face and figure of an honest man argue with herself as she might she had only to compare the bearing of the frenchman with that of stephen ferrers for an answer to her questions she arose and walked to the table by the window the sun was setting in an effusion of red picking out the chimney pots and gables opposite in crimson splendor glorifying the sombre things it touched in magnificent detail she looked long until the top of the very highest chimney pots became again a sombre blur against the greenish glow of the east i shall know she murmured at last at whatever cost captain ferrers shall tell me and before the captain arrived the next day she had resolved upon a plan of action in justice to monsieur mornay she would give his tale the most exhaustive test for the sake of the experiment she would assume that it was true but if it were and she believed it the difficulty lay in getting captain ferrers to acknowledge anything she must deceive him if her deception did not avail she would try something else but of one thing she was resolved that tell he should or all the friendship she bore him should cease for ever captain ferrers wore a jubilant look as he came in the door my service barbara you are better i hope she smiled well he's gone escaped us last night and got to ship in the river by this time he is well into the channel mistress barbara frowned perceptibly you have allowed him to get away she asked her eyebrows upraised yes he muttered a very demon possesses the man if i had my way the fellow should never have left this room she motioned to a seat beside her tell me about it she said he sat and told her such of the happenings at the fleece tavern as he thought well for her to hear but he omitted to mention the rape of the papers from his pockets of this attack he said after all the fellow is but a common blusterer and bully he waited for his chance and then sat upon me like a fishmonger her eyes sparkled and you she asked he had me off my guard but as he broke away from me i shot at him he paused for a word as i would at a common thief and you did not kill him the words fell cold and impassive from her lips he looked at her in some surprise she had set her teeth and her hands were tightly clasped upon her knees but her eyes were looking straight before her and gave no sign of any emotion why barbara he said tis truly a mighty hatred you have for the fellow i thought if you were rid of him i despise him she cried vehemently i hate him captain ferris paused a moment and the smile that had crossed his lips told her how sweet her words sounded in his ears ever since he has been in london she went on coolly he has crossed my path at every route and levee wherever i'd turn i'd see his eyes fixed upon me from such a man it was an insult his attentions were odious she gave a hard dry little laugh why could he not have been killed then before he told me this fine tale of his right to my fortunes and estates but surely you don't believe ferris broke in 
i do and i do not she said carefully considering her reply it is a plain tale and he tells it well whether it be likely or unlikely why barbara tis a palpable lie can you not say i can and i cannot she said evenly then she turned around so that she looked full in his eyes i care not whether he be the heir or no i would not listen to his pleadings were he my cousin thrice over captain ferrers laughed tis plain he has not endeared himself mistress mine and then with lowered voice and glance full of meaning do you really mean that you hate him so it was the first time that his manner had given a hint of a secret she turned her head away and looked at the opposite wall i do she replied firmly i do hate him with all my heart ferrers leaned towards her and laid his hand upon one of hers she did not withdraw it her fingers even moved a little as though in response to his touch barbara this man he paused to look down while he fingered one of her rings is an impostor but if he were not would you would you still wish him dead she looked around at him in surprise why what tis a strange question is there a chance that it is true that he is what he says he halted at this abrupt questioning and did not meet her eye no barbara i have not said so but suppose he were the real vicomte de brezac would you still wish him dead it was her turn to be discomfited she averted her head and her eyes moved restlessly from one object upon the table to another have i not told you that i hate him she said the voice was almost a whisper ferrers looked at her as though he would read the inmost depths of her heart she met his eyes a moment and then smiled with a little bitter irony that had a touch of melancholy in it can i find it pleasant thinking she went on that the houses the lands the people who owe me allegiance my goods my habits my very life are not mine but another's a look of satisfaction crossed captain ferrer's face he relinquished her hand and arose what nonsense is this barbara to be bothering your pretty head about such a matter zounds dear lady it is the silliest thing imaginable nay she said with a gesture of annoyance and a woeful look that was only half assumed nay it is no nonsense or silliness should monsieur mornay come back my quandary becomes as grievous as ever ferris had been pacing up and down his hands behind his back he will not come back besides what could he prove he stopped before her she did not answer but trembling waited for him to continue listen barbara there has been something i have had in my mind to tell you the frenchman's story has made some impression upon you she looked up almost plaintively how could it fail then she went on for his encouragement it would make no difference to me whether he is the heir or no so why should it make a difference to you that decides me the fellow is gone for ever he will never cross your path again you think your quandary is grievous even if the fellow came back what could he prove nothing i will tell you why because the only proofs of another heir to the estate are in my possession it was out at last the thing she had half hoped yet most dreaded to hear rang in her ears she got up making no effort to conceal her emotion and walking to a window leaned heavily upon the back of her chair 
the proofs, the papers, are in your possession? And then, with an attempt at gaiety which rang somewhat discordantly, "'Tis fortunate that they still remain in the hands of my friends. "'I have been through fire and water for them, dear Barbara, "'and will go again if need be. "'Last Wednesday night these papers were given me in sacred trust "'to safely keep or destroy. "'It were better had I destroyed them. "'As you know, my regiment is about to take the field. "'I have but just changed my lodgings.' and had no place of security for them so since then i have carried them upon my person until i could place them safely and then he told her how they had been taken from him by mornay and how he had recovered them to his surprise and delight somewhat moist but perfectly legible from the doublet in the boat which was sunk by the vessel in the river she listened to him with eyes that spoke volumes of her interest and wonder when that was done she asked him more of the secret and he told her how her guardian had so long kept it from her and how captain cornbury had carried the story to mornay he broke off suddenly and went over to where she stood barbara can you not put this matter from your mind will you ruin our day with this silly business have you no word for me have you no thought for me no answer to the question that is for ever on my lips in my eyes and heart she looked around at him her clear eyes smiling up with an expression he could not fathom the level brows were calm and judicial the eyes though smiling were cognizant and searching the lips yes stephen said she in a tantalizing way the eyes a little perhaps but the heart she dropped her eyes and turned her head away the heart of man is a mystery but captain ferrers was undaunted he took in his the hand that hung at her side why barbara he said have i not given you all my devotion can you not learn she drew a little away from him i am but a dumb scholar and do not add deafness to your failings listen to me i have asked you again and again the same question answer me now barbara promise me that you will she had turned around and faced him looking him full in the eyes what would you do for me if i promised you what you wish but my love anything anything in my power to win anything in my gift to bestow she smiled gaily very well she said i shall begin at once first i shall want the papers in your possession his face clouded he dropped her hand and fell back a pace or two the proofs the very same she said coolly my trust he exclaimed i have sworn to keep them secret or destroy them she turned away pettishly so much for your love captain ferrers you swear to give me anything the first favor i ask you refuse but my honor barbara you would not have me break oath with the dead will you give me the papers she asked again imperturbably he looked at her uncertainly and if i do not give them to you then you may go she pointed imperiously to the door you are cruel and if i do give them her face lighted ah if you give them perhaps he leaned forward well perhaps perhaps you may have an answer when he took her hand again she gave it to him unresistingly if i give you these papers will you promise me to be my wife she had obtained her end and at the price she had expected to pay and yet she hesitated she dropped her head and 
her figure seemed to relax and grow smaller under his touch he leaned over her expectancy and delight written upon his features will you promise barbara he repeated she straightened her head but did not draw away as she answered at last i will he put his hands in his breast and drawing out the packet laid it before her upon the table there is my honor barbara take it i give it to you willingly as i give you my life she took the packet of papers and looked at the blurred writing upon the outside captain ferrers made a step towards her and taking her hand again would have drawn her towards him but as he approached and she felt his breath warm upon her cheek a change came over her and she drew back and away from him to the other side of the table captain ferrers could not understand his brows knit angrily how now barbara he began not to-day stephen not to-day i pray you she was half smiling half crying can you not see i am overwrought with my grief and worries leave me for the day i will requite you better another time she fell upon the couch and buried her face in her hands captain ferrers looked at her quizzically for a moment but the smile at his lips was not a pleasant one then he tossed his chin and walked towards the door very well then until to-morrow he took his hat and was gone for some moments mistress barbara lay there as one stricken and unable to move but at last with a struggle she broke the seal of the packet which she had held tightly clutched in her hand then while the sun gilded again the chimney pots opposite her one by one she read over the papers before her the attestation of the nurse marie greyot and the witness anton gratz and pierre dauvet the last testament of eloise de brisac and her confession the statement of the priest who had confessed her and the description of the child all sworn and properly subscribed to before an official of the parish of st jacques then there were some letters from juan d'agnasco clear proof of henry haywood and wilfred clark's complicity in the plot the tears came to her eyes and made even dimmer the blur of the ink in the faded documents at last the letters became indistinct and she could read no more far into the night she lay there her duenna would have entered but she sent her away servants came with food but she refused to eat at last when the reflection from the passing links no longer flashed in fiery red across her ceiling and the sounds of the street were no longer loud or frequent she arose and putting her head out of the window looked up at the quiet stars the cool air bathed her brow and the tranquillity and all-pervading equality of peace helped her to her resolution the next day as captain stephen ferrers presented himself at mistress clark's lodgings he was given a letter this is the cry of a soul that suffers it ran i have read one by one the papers you have given me and from them an iron resolution has been forged forged with the warmth of passion and tempered with the wet of tears yesterday i was your promised wife unless you wish to be released i am the same to-day but this morning every estate that i possess every revenue all my fortune in fact down to the last penny has been placed under the crown where it will remain until the rightful heir of the estates of de brezac is found believe me this decision of mine is irrevocable if you would claim me for yourself under these new conditions i shall still be the same to you barbara captain ferrers left the house in some haste a week later he went to france upon a commission to purchase guns for the royal artillery and mistress barbara clark 
sailed as duena to senorita de batville the daughter of the spanish ambassador to visit the senorita's uncle who was governor of a castle at porto bello upon the spanish main End of chapter 7chapter eight of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the saucy sally monsieur mornay and his companions made but a sorry spectacle upon the decks of the vessel aboard of which the hand of destiny had so fortuitously tumbled them the frenchman had lost his doublet hat and periwig the blood flowed freely from a wound in his head and his bowed figure was slim and lean in his clinging and dripping garments the irishman stood near with one hand upon the frenchman's shoulder watching him narrowly fearful that in another mad moment he might throw himself overboard after his lost heritage but m mornay made no move to struggle further he stood supine and subordinate to his fate the light of battle which had so recently illumined them shone in his eyes no more and the head which by the grace of god had been raised last night so that he could look every man level in the eyes was now sunk into his shoulders not in humiliation or abasement but in a silent acquiescence to the whelming sense of defeat that was his cornbury his red poll glowing a dull amber in the moonlight stood by the side of his friend erect smiling his usual inscrutable self presently when a lantern had been brought the man with the black beard came forward again and placed himself arms akimbo before the bedraggled figures of the fugitives his voice was coarse and thick like his face and body as he leaned sideways to accommodate the squint of one eye and looked at them in high humour an odour of garlic and brandy proclaimed itself so generously that even the rising breeze could not whip it away so ho he said again so ho so ho while he swayed drunkenly from one foot to the other queer fishing even for the thames mateys so ho if there be luck in hot numbers then is the very luck of danny mcgraw for all the oddities who oh, redhead whither was ye bound newgate or tyburn or the tower the tower ye han got much other hair or prisoner's estate cornbury looked him over coolly and then with a laugh but dad my dear man we'd had the smell of all three i'm thinking by this time half the crew of the vessel were gathered in a leering and grinning circle Psst, said one tis the duke of york in disguise the duke of york said another ay ay and the little ones the prince of wales blackbeard thrust his nose under that of the irishman well redhead he cried what's a crime murder or thieving or harson to lend force to his query he clapped his hand down upon cornbury's shoulder the irishman's eyes gleamed and his hand went to his side but he forgot that his weapon was no longer there he shrugged a careless shoulder and drew away a pace whist he said good-humouredly tis the king i've just killed <laughs> tis the red and the blood royal upon his head said the drunkard amid a wild chorus of laughter here a tall figure thrust through the grinning crowd which gave back a step at the sound of his voice non de non he cried 
a shiver with the cold a drink and a dip in the slope chest is more to the point eh captain blackbeard swayed stupidly again and with a growl that might have meant anything rolled aft and down below the tall man took the lantern and led the way to the forecastle whither the fugitives followed him but it was not until they got within the glare of the forecastle lantern that they discovered what manner of man it was to whom they owed this benefaction he was tall and thin and his long bony arms hung heavily from narrow shoulders which seemed hardly stout enough to sustain their weight from a thick thatch of tangled beard and hair a long scrawny neck thrust forward peeringly like that of a plucked fowl and at the end of it a smallish head with a hooked nose black beady eyes and great projecting ears was bonneted in a tight-fitting woolen cap which made more prominent these eccentricities of nature this astonishing figure would have seemed emaciated but for a certain deceptive largeness of bone and sinew his nether half ended in a pair of long shanks attired in baggy trousers and boots between which two bony knees very much bowed were visible by his manner he might have been english by his language french by his ugliness anything from a pirate to an evil dream of the devil monsieur mornay had reached the forecastle in a kind of stupefaction and it was not until the ugly man returned from below with some dry clothing and a bottle of brandy that he came broadly awake then wet and shivering he threw aside his shirt and drank a generous tinful of grateful liquor which sent a glow of warmth to the very marrow of his chilled bones for the first time he glanced at his benefactor me dieu he cried in joyful surprise jacquard the tall man bent forward till his neck seemed to start from its fastenings by the devil's pot why what oh, it cannot be monsieur le chevalier is it you in his surprise he dropped the bottle from his hand and the liquor ran a dark stream upon the deck but regardless he made two strides to mornay's side and taking him by the shoulders looked him eagerly in the face it is it is holy virgin monsieur le capitaine how came you here cornbury had never looked upon so ill-assorted a pair but watched them stand hand clasped in hand each looking into the face of the other a small world jacquard how came you to leave rochelle oh monsieur said the other wagging his head times are not what they have been the sea has called me again my flesh dried upon my bones i could not stay longer ashore and a profitable venture a profitable venture on a jacquard where do you go monsieur the saucy sally is no proper ship for you he moved his head with a curious solemnity from side to side no place for you we go a long voyage monsieur he broke off abruptly but tell me how came you in such straits as these then monsieur mornay told jacquard briefly of the fight in the fleece tavern and of their escape and after this cornbury learned how jacquard had been the chevalier mornay's coxswain upon the dieu merci in the marine of france but through it all jacquard preserved a solemn and puzzled expression which struggled curiously with his look of delight at the sight of mornay at last unable longer to contain himself he glanced stealthily around to 
where the men were swinging their hammocks and said in a kind of shouting whisper monsieur you cannot stay upon the saucy sally to-morrow before we leave the channel you must get ashore monet looked curiously at the man why jacquard you too your sally is none so hospitable alas after all upon my faith it is too bad in an old shipmate i had but just coaxed myself into a desire to stay and here jacquard's face was a study in perplexities he drew the fugitives to a small room or closet when the door was shut he sat down his mouth and face writhing with the import of the information he could not bring himself to convey odds life man growled cornbury have you the twitches speak out monsieur le chevalier said jacquard tis no cruise for you we go to the havana and the maracaibo and he hesitated again out with it before you get in irons you hang in the wind like a fluttering maid well monsieur we are a filibustier no more no less he growled voila you have it i had hoped to his surprise monsieur mornay broke into a wild laugh <laughs> you jacquard honest jacquard a farbon a pirato well not just that monsieur a filibustier he said sulkily there is a difference besides the times were bad i went to the spanish main and became a boucanier monsieur listen we are not a common pirato no monsieur this ship is owned by a person high in authority and captain billy winch bears a warrant from the king under this we make a judicious war upon the ships of spain and none other we have taken their ships in honest warfare with much mercy and compassion a very prodigy of virtue your sally is too trim a maiden to be altogether honest eh monet paused a moment looking at his old shipmate then burst into a loud laugh bah jacquard say with you i will whether or no i am at odds with the world from to-night i too am a filibustier if i cannot go to the cabin aft i will go to the forecastle if not as master as man par dieu as the very lowest and blackest devil of you all you monsieur you yes i i have squeezed life dry jacquard i have given my best in the service of honour and pride they have given me rank and empty honours and all the while have kept me from my dearest desire from to-night virtue and i are things apart i throw her from me as i would throw a sour lemon a pirato cornbury came around and placed a hand upon each of the frenchman's shoulders while he looked him straight in the eyes monsieur le chevalier he said soberly monsieur de brezac at the sound of that name he had staked so much to win the frenchman dropped his eyes before the steady gaze of the irishman but if his poor heart trembled his body did not slowly but firmly he grasped the wrists of his friend and brought his hands down between them no no cornbury he said it must not be that sacred name 
even that will not deter me it is done may she who bears it find less emptiness in honor and life than i i wish her no evil but i pray that we may never meet or the fate which makes men forget their manhood as i forget mine to-night may awake the sleeping god in me to living devil and demand that i make of her a very living sacrifice upon its very altar rene i pray you cried cornbury monet did not even hear him i yield at last from the time i came into the world i have been the very creature of fate i have struck my colors cornbury i have hauled down my gay pennons i have left my sheep he leaned for a moment brokenly upon the bulkhead but before cornbury could speak he started up no no vice shall command here if she will she will be but a poor mistress can she not serve me better than ambition and honor come cornbury come to the spanish main there'll be the crash of fight once more and a dip into the wild life that brings forgetfulness come cornbury jacquard who had been listening to this mad speech with his mouth as wide agape as his eyes and ears rose to his feet monsieur he asked joyfully you will go with us to the spanish main yes yes and be a common buccaneer a cutthroat said cornbury the ironical ay but man ye have no position here ye'll be cuffed and beaten maybe shot by young drunken captain i've been beaten before monsieur gladly broke in jacquard upon whom the light had dawned at last monsieur i am second in command here and half the crew are french i'm not without authority upon them set your mind at rest with these men you shall have fair play he paused scratching his head with the captain it is another matter bah jacquard i've weathered worse storms your captain is a stubborn dog but i've a fancy he barks the loudest when in drink come condary i'm resolved to start from the bottom rung of the ladder once more will you not play at pirate for a while unless i mistake said cornbury coolly i have no choice in the matter the walking is but poor and i've no humour for a swim my dear man you may rest your mind on that you're a madman of that i'm assured but i'll stay with you a while End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Bras de Fer. And so for the present it was settled. Monsieur Monet sought rest vainly and crept upon deck at the first flashing of the sun upon the horizon the sally dressed in a full suit of clothes upon her masts went courtesying upon her course with a fine show of white about her bows and under her counter the brig was not inaptly named for there was an impudence in the rake of her masts and in the way she wore her canvas which belied her reputation for a sober and honest dealing merchantman there was a suggestion of archness too in the way her slender stem curved away from the caresses of the leaping foam which danced rosy and warm with the dawn to give her greeting 
and a touch of gallantry in the tosses and swayings of her prow and head as they nodded up and down the very soul of careless coquetry but now and then an opalescent sea more venturesome and intrepid than his fellows would catch her full in the bluff of the bows and go a-flying over her forecastle in a shower of spume and water drops which in the golden light turned into jewels of many hues and went flying across the deck to be carried down to the cool translucent deeps under her lee but she shook herself free with a disdainful sweeping toss and set her broad bows out towards the open where the colors were ever growing deeper and the winds more rude and boisterous as though she recked not how impetuous the buffets of the storm how turbulent the caresses of the sea something of the exhilaration of the old life came upon m mornay as he sent a seaman like eye aloft at the straining canvases the sally was leaving the narrows and making for the broad reaches where the channel grew into the wide ocean far away over his larboard quarter growing ever dimmer in the eastern mist of the morning was the coast of france the land where he was born where he had suffered and struggled to win the good name he thought his birth had denied him on his right slipping rapidly astern was england where he had come to crown his labors with a new renown and where he had only squandered that favor he had passed so many years of stress in winning squandered it for a fancy that now was like some half-forgotten dream it seemed only yesterday that he had been standing there upon the, a vessel of his own looking out to sea a year had passed since he had given up the command of the dieu merci and gone to paris a year of reckless abandon to pleasure at the gay court of charles a year in which he had lived and forgotten what had gone before a year in which he had been born into a life that was his by every right a dream yes a dream it was a rough awakening he looked down at his rough clothing his baggy red trousers with the tawdry brass buttons his loose coarse shirt and rough boots the rudest slops that the brig provided he felt of his short hair under the woolen cap and he wondered if this could be himself the chevalier mornay the cock of the birdcage walk friend of princes and the intimate of a king astern across the swirling wake lay a city of pleasure but the bitter smile that came into his face had none of the rancor and hatred it spoke rather of failure of disappointment of things forsaken and unachieved from these reflections he was surprised by the sound of a voice at his elbow there beside him stood a fat man munching at a sea biscuit his face in consonance with the body was round and flabby but there the consistency ended for in color it was gray like a piece of mildewed sailcloth the distinguishing feature of his person was his nose which round and inflamed shone like a beacon in the middle of his pallid physiognomy his voice was lost in the immensity of his frame for when he spoke it seemed to come from a long distance as though choked in the utterance by the layers of flesh which hung from his chin and throat the pucker which did duty for a frown upon his brow became a fat knot you was a passenger upon this ship hey he said with well-considered sarcasm you was a passenger 
You think you make this voyage to America and do nothing, hey? By God, we'll see about that. And all the while he kept munching at the sea biscuit, and Monsieur Mornay stood leaning against the rail, watching him. You was a French duke or something, ain't it? Well, we want none of the royal family aboard the saucy Sally, and when I or the captain or shucky shuckart give the orders you jump or oh, by god i'll know why not but still mornay looked at him smiling he was in a reckless mood and welcomed any opportunity that took him out of himself well the dutchman asked his little thin voice grown shrill with rising temper why don't you move why you stunt looking at me and rushing suddenly forward he aimed a blow of his heavy boot at mornay which had it reached its destination must have wrought a grave injury to the frenchman so great an impetus had it that not finding the expected resistance the foot flew high in the air but the frenchman was not there he had stepped quickly aside and deftly catching the heel of the boot in his hand threw the surprised dutchman completely off his balance so that he fell a sprawling mass of squirming fat upon the deck the commotion had drawn a number of the crew aft and the captain reeling uncertainly to the roll of the vessel came blinking and puffing up the after ladder by this time the dutchman had struggled to an upright posture and come rushing upon mornay again all arms and legs sputtering and furious but the captain no matter how deep in drink was a person with the shrewdest sense of his importance upon a ship of his own he was jealous of all blows not aimed by his own sturdy fist and it was his fancy that none should strike any but himself it was therefore with a sense of his outraged office that he rushed between the two men and with his bulky body and long arms averted the windmill attack of the burly dutchman mutiny by and not out of soundings stand fast gratz stand fast i say i'll do the billy cuddling on this ship stand i say now what is it gratz stepped forward a pace and spat yah i give her orders and she stumbled me backwards upon the deck what roared the captain so -ho, we'll see and he seized a pen from the rail the situation was threatening winch was already striding forward and his upraised pin seemed about to descend upon the luckless mornay when jacquard interposed a long bony arm fair play billy winch you'll slaughter the man out of the way fair play i say billy winch jacquard stood his ground and only gripped the captain the tighter fair play billy winch i tell you gratz fell over his own feet i saw it listen to me the captain paused a moment the lie had distracted him and in that pause jacquard saw safety the captain looked blearily at mornay who had made no move to defend himself but stood with little sign of discomposure awaiting the outcome of the difficulty if monsieur le capitaine will but allow me by cut broke in gratz you shall not and made a wild effort to strike mornay again but this time jacquard caught him and twisted him safely out of the way by the devil's pot roared winch am i in command or am i not 
he raised his weapon this time towards gratz who cowered away as though he feared the blow would fall if monsieur le capitaine will allow me began mornay again politely i would take it as a pleasure <laughs> you sneered the captain with a kind of laugh you why frenchman yon gratz will make three a year he'll eat your skin and bones jacquard smiled a little voila billy winch he cried the way out of your difficulty a little circle upon the deck a falchion or a half-pike fair play for all and yo yo fair play fair play yelled the crew rejoicing at the prospect of the sport billy winch blinked a bleared and bloodshot eye at jacquard and mornay and then a wide smile broke the sluggish surface of the skin into numberless wrinkles if you'll have it that way he grinned you'll be stuck like a sheep but twill save me trouble so fight away my bully and be damned to ye immediately a ring was formed into which the combatants were speedily pushed gratz laughed in his shrillest choked falsetto while he threw off his coat and leered at the frenchman the huge bulk of the man was the more apparent when his coat had been removed for in spite of his girth and fat his limbs were set most sturdily in his body and though the muscles of his arms moved slothfully beneath the skin it was easily to be seen that this was a most formidable antagonist that he himself considered his task a rare sport which would still further enhance his reputation among the crew was easily to be perceived in the way he looked at monsieur mornay and in this opinion he was not alone for even cornbury who had pressed closely to the frenchman's side wore a look which showed how deep was his concern over his friend's predicament only jacquard of all those who stood about felt no fear for mornay upon the dieu merci he had seen the chevalier do a prodigy of strength and skill which had settled a mutiny once and for all and had earned him a title which had given him a greater reputation in the marine of france than all the distinctions which the king had seen fit to bestow and as jacquard looked at him slim and not over tall but cool and deliberate as upon his own deck three years ago the frenchman became again rene bras de fer rene the iron arm who fought for the love of fighting only and who knew nothing of fear on sea or land that superiority in men which in spite of every adverse circumstance will not be denied shone so conspicuously in the face and figure of the frenchman that the row of hairy faces about him looked in wonder there was a rough jest or two for yon gratz had won his way from the bowsprit aft by buffets and blows and had waxed fat in the operation to them he was the very living embodiment of a fighting devil of the sea but many of them saw something in the cool impassive expression of the frenchman a something which had won him friends and enemies before this and were silent the frenchman with a quiet deliberation rolled the sleeves of his shirt above his elbows and took the half pike that was thrust into his hands it has been said that the chevalier mornay was not above the medium height nor with the exception of an arm which might have seemed a little too long to be in perfect proportion gave in his appearance any striking evidence of 
especial physical prowess he had been known in london for a graceful and ready sword and in his few encounters he had never received so much as a scratch but even gratz was stricken with wonderment at the appearance of the forearm which his wide sleeves had so effectually concealed the arm of the chevalier as he brought his pike into a posture of defence showed a more remarkable degree of development than he had ever seen before in any man frenchman or englishman of his stature the legs strong and straight as they were with a generous bulge at the calf betrayed nothing of this wonderful arm which swelling from a strong though not an unslender wrist rose in fine layers of steel-like ligament tangled and knotted like the limbs of an oak and up above the elbow the falling cotton shirt scarcely hid the sturdy bulk of muscle which swelled and trembled as the fingers moved the weapon down upon the guard to resist the furious attack of the hollander gratz prided himself no less upon his use of the pike than upon his use of his fists and boots and thinking to end the matter in a summary fashion which might atone for his somewhat awkward fall upon the deck he began thrusting hotly and with a skill which had hitherto availed his purposes but he soon discovered that with this frenchman whom he had so heartily challenged he was to have no advantage either in the reach or in the knowledge of the game mornay's play he quickly learned was to allow him completely to exhaust himself this instead of teaching him caution only increased his fury so that in the end of a few moments of fruitless exertion he found himself puffing like a great grampus the perspiration pouring blindingly into his eyes and down his arms until his fat hands grew moist and slipped uncertainly upon the handle of his weapon the cloud that had hung upon cornbury's face at the beginning of the combat had disappeared and with a childish delight in the clash of arms he watched his friend slowly but surely steal away the offensive power of the dutchman whose look of confidence had been replaced by a lightness of eye and a quivering of the forehead and lips which denoted the gravest quandary of uncertainty monsieur mornay was breathing rapidly but his brows were as level his eye as clear his hand as steady as when he had begun in a few moments the struggle which had promised such dire results became a farce the frenchman had suddenly assumed the offensive and beating down the guard of the other began pricking him gently with rare skill and discrimination in different conspicuous parts of his anatomy the chevalier's weapon was sharp and the skin of jan gratz was tender but so nicely were the thrusts of the frenchman tempered to the occasion that they did no more than draw a small quantity of blood at each place which oozed forth in patches upon his moist and clinging shirt so that he presently resembled some huge spotted animal of an unknown species which disaster might have driven from its fastness in the deep it would have been a remarkable exhibition of skill with a cut-and-thrust sword or a rapier but with a half-pike it was little less than marvellous jan gratz struggled on his tired arms vainly striving against the frenchman's assaults once when the dutchman had been disarmed m mornay generously allowed him to regain his weapon choosing the advantage of jan gratz posture however to complete the circle of his punctures by a prick in the seat of his honour which quickly straightened him again when the game had gone far enough and the pallid 
pasty face of jan gratz was so suffused that it looked little less red than his nose or the blood upon his shirt and his gasps for breath were become so short that they threatened to come no more at all monsieur mornay threw his weapon down upon the deck and breathing deeply folded his arms and stood at rest mine here he said it was a mistake to have begun i am the best half pikeman in france the dutchman blinked at him with his small pig eyes out of which the bitterness of his humiliation flashed and sparkled in a wild and vengeful light the frenchman turned his back to pass beyond the circle of grinning men who had not scrupled to hide their delight and admiration at his prowess in vanquishing their bully but gratz whose exhaustion even could not avail to curb his fury put all the small star of his remaining energy in a savage rush which he directed full at the back of the retiring frenchman a cry arose and mornay would have been transfixed had not cornbury intercepted the cowardly thrust by a nimble foot over which the dutchman stumbled and fell sprawling into the scuppers the point of his weapon grazed the arm of mornay and stuck quivering in the deck a yard beyond where he had stood jacquard rushed to the prostrate figure in a fury at his treachery but the man made no sign or effort to arise by the holy rood a craven stroke cried the captain fetching the dutchman a resounding kick which brought forth a feeble groan get up he roared get up and go forward hordes niggers we want none but honest blows among shipmates jan gratz struggled to his feet and stumbled heavily down into the deck-house jacquard was grinning from ear to ear if he had planned the combat himself the result could not have been more to his liking the favor of billy winch was no small thing to win and m mornay had chosen the nearest road to his heart the captain after hurling a parting curse at the dutchman's figure slouched over to mornay zounds but you have a hand for the pike my bully have you aught a seamanship if you know your hangles you're the very figure of a mate for saucy sally for we want no more im and he jerked his finger in the direction taken by jan gratz mornay laughed i've had the dick of a taller ship than saucy sally billy winch grasped mornay by the hand right heartily come what do you say me and jacky jacquard and you we three aft we'll need a ye zounds much of the useful thrust and parry then he roared with laughter and i'm mistaken if you're not as handy a liar as a pikeman i've seen the play of the best in the french marine and captain rene mornay would have a word to say with ye as to who's the best half pikeman in france jacquard held his sides to better contain himself his mouth opened widely and his little eyes were quite closed with the excess of his delight mornay and cornbury smiled a little and the frenchman said with composure perhaps monsieur le capitaine mornay and i are not strangers but he holds his reputation so low and i mine so high that i cannot bring myself to fight him here jacquard could no longer contain himself can you not see further than the end of your bowsprit billy winch he cried and while the captain wondered can you not see stupid fish 
tis brother fair himself blackbeard fell back a step or two in his amazement while a murmur swept over the crew who loathed to leave the scene had remained interested listeners to the colloquy what rene the iron arm aboard the sally said the captain approaching the frenchman again so ho oh, though by st paul's ye are not unlike and with a wig and a doublet upon my soul jacky jacquard but i believe tis the truth say is it so master i am rene mornay said the frenchman so ho oh, he roared in delight then sally shall give ye meat and drink and make a bed to ye and when ye will shall set ye ashore in france or if ye care for the clashing of arms shall show ye the way to the galleons of spain come let's below and drink to better understanding it was thus that monsieur mornay sailed forth to the spanish main End of chapter 9chapter ten of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva bras de fer makes a capture the feat at arms of monsieur mornay at the expense of the luckless gratz had set the ship by the ears and with little opposition bras de fer became the third in command before many weeks were gone it was discovered that he had his seamanship at as ready a convenience as his pipe play for in a troublesome squall in a windy watch on deck while jacquard was below he had not scrupled to take the command from captain billy winch who was so deep in liquor that he didn't know the main brace from a spritsail sheet and who had had the sally upon her beam-ends with all his ports and hatches open mornay sprang to the helm and gave the orders necessary to bring her to rights indeed the command had clearly devolved upon jacquard for the lucid intervals of captain billy winch were becoming less and less until from that state of continued jubilation which marked his departure from the port of london he had passed into one of beatific unconsciousness from which he only aroused himself to assuage his thirst the more copiously one black morning in the wilds of the atlantic he reached the deck his eyes wide with fever and his mouth full of oaths swearing that he would no longer stay below but his legs were so completely at a loss that what with the wild plunges of the vessel and the assaults of the seas which made clean breaches over her he was thrown down into the scuppers again and again and all but drowned in the wash of the deck but the bruising and sousing in the salt water instead of rebuffing him or abating a whit of his ardour but served to sober him and make him the more ambitious to take his proper place aboard the vessel jacquard would have restrained him but he threw the frenchman aside and while trying to descend the ladder at the angle of the poop lost his balance and catching wildly at the lee bulwark disappeared in the dirty smother under the quarter and was seen no more after this mishap jacquard went below to the cabin with mornay to make his plans for the future of the saucy sally there among the rum reeking effects of the captain he discovered the royal charter and warrant under which the vessel sailed together with the lists of spanish vessels which should have left port their destinations and probable values jacquard outlined the plans he had made for their operations when they should have reached the waters he had chosen 
cornbury who had been reading abstractedly in the warrant gave a sudden cry brezac he said pointing a long forefinger upon the parchment faith my dear man your fortune is a silly whimsical jade after all cast your eye hither for a moment of time monet took the document in amazement whereas it hath come to our notice it began that certain enemies of the state sailing in the vessels of the kingdom of spain have prepared ordered and levied war against us and have molested and harassed our lawful commerce upon the sea to the oppression of our loyal subjects carrying on the same by the advice of our privy council we hereby grant to our good and loyal subject henry hayward knight that his vessel or vessels tis as plain as a pike handle said cornbury and as mornay still scanned the document faith can you not see you are a guest upon a vessel of your own the vessel and all she owns is yours man yours parbleu said mornay when the edge of his wonderment was dull i believe you a rare investment indeed for the millions of the brisacs a thousand per centum at the very least with a modicum for the king ye cannot wonder how charles bewailed the man's demise ye touched his purse rene and friendship has little to expect from the conscience of an empty pocket by my life it is so said the wide-eyed mornay jacquard shall know listen my friend and with a particular reticence with regard to the name of mistress clark he told jacquard of the great secret the rape of the papers and the other things pertaining to his discovery it was learned that in the matter jacquard knew only one captain braille a ship chandler and owner who had the finding of all the sea appurtenances the making of the contracts and the furnishing of the stores the sympathetic jacquard followed m mornay through a description of the duel his face wreathed in smiles his eyes shining with delight he wept at the tale of the mother commiserated the orphan and when he learned how sir henry haywood had taken possession of the proofs of the boy's birth and lineage and had kept him from his rightful inheritance jacquard rose upon his long legs and swore aloud at the man's perfidy when mornay had finished he sat silent a moment clasping and unclasping his knotted bony fingers it is a strange story monsieur the strangest i have ever heard it means monsieur that upon the saucy sally at least you have come into your own besides once my captain always my captain allons it shall be as before bras de fer shall lead jacquard shall obey that is all he arose and took m mornay by the hand henceforth he said it shall be captain rene bras de fer now we will go upon the deck and i shall tell them although the death of billy winch had caused much commotion aboard the vessel the crew in the main were tractable and compliant upon his own great popularity upon the reputation of bras de fer and upon the large portion of the crew who were frenchmen like himself jacquard relied to effect the necessary changes in the management of the vessel the frenchman's bearing since he had come aboard had been such as to enhance rather than to remove the early impression that he had made and but a spark was needed to amalgamate him with the ship's company that spark jacquard dexterously applied he called all hands aft and with a stirring appeal to their imagination one by one recalled the feats of the chevalier 
the fight in the open boat with the austrian pirate the defiance of the spanish admiral under the very guns of the bonaventura the six duels upon the landing place at kronberg the wreck of the saint barbe and the mutiny an ignominious defeat of jean goujon upon the dieu merci all of these things he painted with glowing colors so that as he stepped forth upon the deck they hailed bras de fer with a glad acclaim then bras de fer told them what he hoped to do and read them amid huzzas the list of spanish shipping when the matter of the captaincy had been duly settled beyond a doubt with a grace which could not fail to gain approval he unhesitatingly appointed jan gratz again the third in command and this magnanimity did much to unite him to the small faction which stood aloof the frank confidence he placed in the hollander put them upon the terms of an understanding which gratz accepted with as good a grace as he could bring to the occasion a cask of rum was brought up on the deck and the incident ended in jubilation and health-giving which in point of good fellowship and favorable augury left nothing to be desired at the end of a week bras de fer had given still more adequate proofs of his ability with a shrewd eye he had discovered the natural leaders among the crew these he placed in positions of authority then appointing cornbury master-at-arms put the men upon their medal at pike play and the broadsword with such admirable results that the carousing and laxity engendered by the habits of captain billy wench became less and less until the rum casks were no more brought up on deck except upon rare and exceptional occasions of growls there were a few and here and there a muttering apprised him of dissatisfaction among the free drinkers but he offered prizes from the first spanish vessel captured for those most proficient in the manly arts to appease their distaste for the sport himself entering upon the games with a spirit and a poise which were irresistible the unrestrained life had caught the fancy of cornbury too and with nimble tongue and nimbler weapon he won his way with the rough blades as though he had entered upon this service by the same horse-pipe as themselves once when a not too complimentary remark had been passed upon his beard which was grown long and of an ingenuous crimson he took the offender by the nose and at the point of his sword forced him upon his knees to swear by all the saints that his lifelong prayer had been that some exclusive dispensation of nature should one day turn his beard the very self-same colour as the irish captains who then in satisfaction of the cravings of that reluctant delinquent forced him below to the paint closet where he caused him to bedaub himself very liberally with a pigment of the same uncompromising hue so liberally that not storm nor stress could avail for many weeks to wash clean the stigma indeed so strikingly did the combative characteristics of his race manifest themselves in the performance of his new duties that but for jacquard the aggressive irishman had been almost continually embroiled but as it was cornbury served his captain a useful purpose and though the ready tact of bras de fer averted serious difficulties there were adventures aplenty for the master-at-arms enough at least to satisfy the peculiar needs of his temperament in this fashion learning a discipline of gunnery arms and seamanship and a little of discontent at the restraint besides they crept south across the broad atlantic 
gales buffeted them and blew them from their course but after many weeks they made northing enough to cross the path of the spanish silver ships from south america the first vessel they took was a galleon from caracas she was heavy with spices and silks but had lost her convoy in the night and was making for porto bello a shot across her bows hove her to and her guard of soldiers gave her up without a struggle the sally hove alongside and here came the first test of the discipline of bras de fer the fellows rushed aboard with drawn weapons and finding no resistance were so enraged at the lack of opportunity to display their new prowess that they fell to striking lustily right and left and driving the frightened spaniards forward shrieking down into the hold twas rare sport for cornbury who went dancing forward aiding the progress of the flying foe with the darting end of his back-sword only the best efforts of bras de fer prevented the men from following the victims below where darker deeds might have been done jan gratz who had made one voyage with an old pirato named mansfeld made so bold as to propose that the spaniards be dropped overboard that being the simplest solution of the difficulty but bras de fer clapped the hatches over the prisoners with a decision which left little doubt in the minds of the crew as to his intentions there was a flare of anger at this high-handed discipline for they were free men of the sea they said and owed nothing to any one captain billy wench had been none too particular in this matter of detail but in spite of their curses bras de fer brought the prisoners and the prize to port in safety it was the beginning of a series of small successes which filled the sally's storerooms and brought three prizes for her into the harbor of port royal jamaica there quarrelsome bedizened and swaggering through the streets of the town broad affair and cornbury saw many of these gentlemen of the sea who owed allegiance to no man company or government in the same trade as themselves it might be save only that with less nice discrimination these gentry robbed broadly while the sally in despite of her very crew fought and took only from the enemies of the english king it was there too that the frenchman met the new english governor and explained the freak of fortune by which he had come to command the sally the governor became most friendly and with a sly look of cupidity which had but one meaning gave information of the sailing of the san isidro from spain bearing the new governor of chagres several bishops and priests and gold and silver coin of inestimable value for the priests of the church in the spanish colonies of america learning that the san isidro would stop at the havana bras de fer filled his water tanks and sailed boldly forth to intercept her it was untried water to the frenchman and charted with so little adequacy that the booming of the surf upon the reefs sounded with a too portentous frequency upon the ears but jacquard had eyes and ears for everything and they won their way to the florida coast without mishap there a hericano buffeted them out to sea and it was with many misgivings that they won their way back to the channels of the bahamas the storm had blown itself out and the ocean shone translucent as an emerald low hanging overhead great patches of fleecy white torn from a heaped-up cloud-bank over the low-lying islands of the eastern horizon took their wild flight across the deep vault of the sky in a mad pursuit of their fellows who had gone before and were lost in a shimmer of purple where the sea met the palm-grown spits of the western main 
the cool pink glow upon the sally's starboard beam filled the swell of the topsails with a soft effulgence which partook of some of the coolness and freshness of the air that drove them far down upon the weather bow first a blur then a shadow which grew from gray to silver and gold came the san isidro jacquard sighted her but it was bras de fer who proclaimed her identity she was a fine new galleon spick and span from the tagus with three tiers of guns and masts of the tallest her bright new foretopsail bore the arms of spain and the long pennons floating from her trucks and poles proclaimed the high condition of her passengers bras de fer cleared his ship for action and called his men aft there my fine fellows he cried is steel worthy of your metal let it not be said that saucy sally takes her sustenance from the weak and cowardly and flirts her helm to the powerful yonder is your prize she has thrice your bulk and complement three gun tiers and twenty score of men so much the more honor for in her hold are gold and silver bright and new minted from the spanish treasury and wines for fat priests which shall run no less smoothly down your own proper throats yonder she is take her follow where i shall lead and she is yours for the asking a roar of approval greeted him and the manner in which the rascals sprang to their places showed that if they growled at his discipline they were ready enough for this opportunity if the spanish vessel had aught of fear for the english brig she did not show it the sound of trumpets had proclaimed that she had called her gun crews but she shifted her helm not a quarter point of the compass and came steadily on bras de fer lost no time sending the english colors aloft and firing a shot from his forward guns as a test of distance this brought the spaniard speedily to himself for he shortened sail and came upon the wind to keep the weather gauge when he had reached easy gunshot distance the sally began firing a gun at a time with great deliberation and so excellent was her aim that few of these failed to strike her huge adversary cornbury who had taken a particular fancy for great gun exercise practised upon the rigging to such advantage that he brought the mizzen topsail and cross jack yard in a clatter about the ears of the fellows upon the poop as the frenchman suspected the spaniard's gunplay was of the poorest and the glittering hordes of harnessed men upon his decks availed him nothing then the san isidro with true concern and thinking to end the matter eased their sheets in the effort to close with her troublesome antagonist bras de fer kept all fast and braving a merciless broadside which churned the ocean in a hundred gusts of water all about him went jauntily up to windward with no other loss than that of the main topgallant yard the wreck of which was quickly cut away for two hours the roar of the battle echoed down the distances the sally presented a forlorn appearance with her main topsail torn to shreds two guns of her broadside had been dismounted and ten of her men had been killed and injured but upon the spaniard the wreck of yards and spars hung festooned with the useless gear upon her wounded masts like tangled mosses or creepers upon a dying oak at last a lucky shot of the unremitting cornbury carried away her pintle rudder and steering gear so that she lay a heavy and lifeless thing upon the water 
bras de fer called for boarders and firing a broadside point-blank lay the sally aboard and with a wild cry for those who dared follow himself sprang for the mizzen chains of his adversary in the light of the dying day like a hundred wriggling dusky cats they swarmed over the sides of the luckless san isidro springing through the ports and over the bulwarks upon the deck with cries that struck terror to the hearts of their adversaries many of whom threw down their weapons and sprang below a few men in breast pieces who gave back firing a desultory volley made a brief stand upon the forecastle from which they were speedily swept down into the head and so forward upon the prow and into the sea bras de fer and cornbury sprang into the after passage two blanched priests fell upon the deck raining their jewels like hailstones before them and chattering out a plea for mercy from the pirato indeed bras de fer looked not unlike the pictures of the most desperate of those bloody villains a splinter cut upon the head had bathed him liberally with blood and the wild light of exultation glowed from eyes deep-set and dark with the fumes of dust and gunpowder his coat was torn and his naked sword dimmed and lustreless moved in reckless circles with a careless abandon which spoke a meaning not to be misconstrued the priests he pushed aside and burst through the door into the cabin it was almost dark but the glow in the west which shone in the wide stern ports shed a warm light upon the backs of a dozen persons who had taken refuge there and were now gazing wide-eyed upon him by the table in the centre two or three figures were standing and an old man with streaming grey hair drew a sword most pitifully and put himself in posture of defence several women thereupon fell gibbering prone upon the deck and two figures in uniform crouched back in the shadow of the bulkhead but the shedding of blood was done cornbury took the weapon from the patriarch and bras de fer seeing no further resistance bowed in his best manner and begged that the ladies be put to no further inquietude it was then for the first time that he noticed the figure of one of them tall fair and of a strange familiarity standing firm and impassive her hand upon a small petronel or pistolet which lay upon the port sill the splendid lines of the neck the imperious turn of the head the determination in the firm lines of the mouth which in spite of the ill-concealed terror which lurked in the eyes and brows betrayed a purpose to defend herself to the last bras de fer stepped back a pace in his surprise to look again but there was no mistake he had seen that same figure that same poise of the head almost that same look out of the eyes and deep as he had steeped his mind in the things which brought forgetfulness every line of it was written upon his memory the lady was mistress barbara clark End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the enemy in the house in the first flood of his astonishment the frenchman lost countenance and fell back upon the entrance of the cabin he forgot the efficiency of his disguise in london he had worn the mustachio smooth chin and peruke and the deft touches of poor vigo had given him a name for a bow which no art of the tailor alone could have bestowed 
all of these were lacking in the rough garments that he wore when last my lady had seen him it had been in the laces orders and all the accoutrements of a man of fashion as befitted his station now the deep shadows which the fog of battle had painted under his brows and eyes served a purpose as effectual as the growth of his hair and beard for no sign passed the lady's features though she looked fair at him the momentary wonder there was as the frenchman paused then a mute and pallid supplication two spanish women fell heavily upon their knees before him demeaning themselves in every conceivable manner for a look or a word that would lull their apprehension and alarm it was not until then that cornbury saw mistress clark she looked at him blankly but he swearing audibly fled past broad affair to the door bedad he muttered the lady in the play and vanished into the passage cast upon himself bras de fer halted and stammered again he was daunted by that cold gray eye and discovered an inquietude and trepidation greater than he had felt in the presence of a company of pikemen he wiped his sword and thrust it into his scabbard with something of an air of the blusterer fumbled at the collar of his throat and with a gesture tossed back the curls from his brow finally taking refuge in the women at his knees from that chill glance which seemed to read and reproach him then learning that his identity was still unrevealed he plucked up courage and releasing himself coldly but with a certain gallantry bowed to the gray-haired spanish lady who had been the most timorous in her embraces you fear senora pays neither me nor my ship a compliment he said coolly your son isidro is of a nation that of late has proved itself the enemy of my king upon the sea i have taken her in honourable battle and here jacquard leering wickedly the personification of the very thing the women most feared with Jan Gratz and a dozen pikes, came rushing in at the door, rendering at naught his amiable intentions, for the women fell to screaming again, and Mistress Clark raised her pistolet to her breast. It seemed, in the very act of firing, with a hoarse cry, Bras de Fer quelled the turmoil, and sent Jacquard and the men growling back upon the deck but it was some moments before the qualms of the women were relieved and quiet and order brought out of the tumult senor what you say may be true said the patriarch who had sought to defend himself but not all who bear the warrant of the king of england have so honest a notion of warfare in these waters what proof have we of your integrity bras de fer tossed his head with a touch of the old hauteur he looked past the grey beard to the casement window where the last glimmer of the western light was burnishing her hair to gold he saw only the fair head of the woman who had discredited him scorned and spanned him as though he had been as low as the very thing he now appeared the lips grew together in a hard line that had in it a touch of cruelty it is not the custom of the officers of the king he said to give proofs of integrity to prisoners of war i offer no proof but my word i shall do with you as i see fit to do and stationing two pikemen at the door of the cabin he went upon the deck filled with the thought which almost drove from his mind the serious business of bringing the wreck to rights and mending his own affairs 
there was much to be done before the sally and her huge captive could be brought out into the safety of the broad ocean away from this dangerous proximity to the havana but bras de fer set himself resolutely to the task and putting beside him all but the matter at hand with a fine seamanlike sense brought order out of the tangle and wreck of rigging both upon his own vessel and the spaniard the night had come on apace and with it a rising wind which ground the vessels together in a manner which threatened to make them the more vulnerable to the assaults of the sea the business of shifting the valuable part of the cargo was going swiftly forward under great flares and ship's lanterns which were stuck in the bulwarks and hung from the chains and rigging bras de fer a black shade against the lurid glow stood with folded arms and downcast eyes at a commanding eminence upon the poop watching the struggling dusky gnome-like figures below him a hoarse order rang from his lips now and then which was echoed down into the bowels of his own vessel and mingled with the cries and oaths of the fellows below blocks creaked above and the swaying bales and chests growing for a moment into fiery patches against the sooty darkness behind them swept over the bulwarks and into gray shadow again when they were speedily borne down into the gaping black maws of the brig a pale and sibilant presence rustled from the shadows of the mizzenmast behind bras de fer trembling in limb and more pallid even than the white frock that enfolded her mistress barbara in a ferment of uncertainty unattended and unguarded had crept resolutely and with indomitable courage past the guard at the cabin door to the side of the conqueror of san isidro so frail and slender a thing she was emerging pale and spectral into the glare of the torches that at the touch of her halting hand upon his arm he started with a quick intaking of breath and sought his weapon but when the light glowed upon the brow and hair and he saw his hand dropped to his side and he bowed his head to hide his features with a gesture of annoyance designed to serve the same end he turned away towards the bulwarks no no she began pleadingly you must hear me i am english like the king you serve at your hands i have every right to consideration you sail in parlous times madame he replied coldly striving to disguise his voice listen sir i have braved danger of insult and worse to come hither to-night but there is something i cannot tell what which says that you will deal fairly your confidence i trust is not ill-placed with averted head your manner of speaking betrays that you are french nay do not turn away monsieur if you are not english you serve an english master and that should be the guarantee of all honesty honesty is as honesty does he replied turning with more assurance to address her and then you'll come a cool dove of peace in time of hot war madame you have no place in such a scene as this give me a word sir and i will go his gaze was fixed blankly upon the starless vacancy i can promise nothing madame it is the fortune of war or fate the last he murmured half below his breath you will take us to jamaica monsieur not to the tortugas say it will not be the tortugas the tortugas are the lair of the piratos if i am such it were useless further to converse a pirate has small stomach for mercy much for requital puzzled somewhat 
she grasped her wrap more closely and drew back in dismay what do you mean that you have no pity that she paused as she saw his bitter smile stepping a pace back from him in horror but the cruel pleasure he had in torturing her at the sight of her dread and fear was pleasure no longer madame forgive me he said with a carefully studied frankness i have only said i can make no promises there are two vessels and i cannot be upon both the wind even now is rising and soon we must be parting company but i will do for you and for the spanish lady your friend what i may and now bending over her with all his old grace now if madame will permit me i will conduct her to the cabin the speech the very words the very gesture the very modulations of the voice where had she heard them before a hurried winging of thought brought the swaying of colored lanterns a garden a graveled walk a perfumed night and while she still looked in wonder a boisterous puff of wind flared up the torch on the mast and tossed his wide-brimmed hat back upon his head so that she saw a scar upon his temple she peered straight forward and he turned his head in vain good god she cried this is it this it was too late to continue the concealment had he wished to do so then while he in turn was peering at her startled at the lively expression of horror in her eyes a horror at his condition and plainly not at himself she covered her face with her fingers and bowed her head into them not shrinkingly in loathing as he might have expected from the woman he had left in london but in an anguish as of penitence the impotence of a child at the reproof of an angry parent in contrition remorse or humiliation he could not understand but straightening himself with a stern dignity which sat well upon him he replied in a tone so low that its vibrant note barely reached her ears this madame even this when she looked up at him again it was with clear level unflinching eyes monsieur she began haltingly but he held up his hand i had hoped to have withdrawn ere this upon my own ship and to have left you thank god that you did not i would atone to you for many things could you have deserted us you owe me a greater debt of humiliation and abasement than you can ever hope to pay but would you abandon us to that crew of demons below ah she shuddered it is a vengeance worthy of the name madame the sparks of such hatred as that you bear for me are best unfed to flame you shall be adequately guarded upon the san isidro but before dawn i and my ship will have sailed no no she broke in you must not you cannot leave the woman in her rebelled at the thought that he could find it possible to do what he promised must and can are strong words he smiled coldly there is no must or can upon the san isidro but mine the governances of st james square are not those of the spanish main madame but the evil she had wrought in this man's life though she had wrought it unconsciously gave her new humility she had done and dared much already she would not go back i pray you monsieur in the name of that mother you once swore by in the name of all the things you hold most holy i pray that you will heed my prayer take at least the senorita de batteville upon your vessel take us from the faces of the men at the cabin door who leer and grin at us with a too horrid import a frown crossed the frenchman's features these men will be upon the saucy sally 
but you monsieur will be there you will not permit madame has a too generous confidence in my competency ah it is for you to be generous a man who can win so great a victory can afford to be kind she put her hands forward in the act of supplication and in doing so the wrap slipped from the shoulder and arm it had so scrupulously hidden a cloth dull and blurred with red was wrapped halfway between the elbow and the shoulder when he saw that dark patch his cool composure fell from him like a mantle and he bent forward eagerly all his perceptions a-quiver with sensibility saint vierge he whispered how came you by that it is nothing she said drawing back at his ardour a scratch of broken glass that is all he bent to the deck for the airing silk i did not know he stammered his voice mellow with sympathy i did not know forgive me madame there is nothing to forgive it is the fortune of war is it painful i am something of a surgeon let me he looked her in the face and then drew back in a mingling of confusion and pride it is nothing i tell you she broke in with a stamp of the foot nothing i do not even feel it and when she had enwrapped it again she lowered her voice until it trembled with the earnestness of her entreaty have pity monsieur pity the frenchman had turned away and was looking out into the moonless night the slender white hand stole faltering forward until it rested upon the coarse sleeve of his coat take me with you monsieur take me aboard the saucy sally and still looking out to sea he replied in a voice gruff and rugged which did not avail to hide a generous courtesy beneath it shall be as you wish madame bid the senorita prepare at once and in a moment when he looked again she was gone how was it that the thread of this woman's life had become entangled again with his could it be that the hand which controlled his destiny had wrought these miracles in his strange career in a mere sport or purposeless plan could it be that two grains of sand afloat on the winds of life's desert they had met parted and come together again in the infinity of wide ocean he had gone adrift upon the tide of another life with nothing but his memories to bind him to the old but sure as metal to its lodestone his vessel had been driven in spite of wind and the raging of the sea with an unerring certainty into the very path of the san isidro how was she the toast of london the bright particular planet in that bright firmament divested of all the bright lustre of her constellation alone and all but friendless adrift in these wild waters how came this gay paradise bird despoiled of its plumage in so foreign a clime why had she left london had some convulsion of her starry sky cast her down from her high seat where was captain ferris were they become estranged what had come of the papers the enigma grew in complexity her speech had puzzled him why had she been thankful to have found him was it the joy of learning that her captor was one who had not sunk so low that he could do the vile deed she had feared of him what atonement was it she offered and for what his heart leapt wildly only to shrink again to a dull drowsy beat what did it mean nothing or anything conciliation mock humility a sop to cerberus bah he was done with hope there a shadow of disconsolation he st
stood fixed and nerveless struggling against the soft cajoling handmaidens of virtue gentleness beauty reverence love personified in this woman whom try as he might he could not pluck from his life the pale light of dawn found him where he watched until the transshipping was done and the cases of coin the silks and plate were stowed safely below the fitful wind which had tossed upon the restless sea was now become so boisterous that the grappling irons were cast off and the saucy sally drifted away from the spaniard and hung with a backed mainsail a half cable's length under her lee the prisoners of the san isidro had been carefully secured below and a prize crew of jacquard cornbury and thirty men had been placed upon her to bring the wreck into port she was sound enough below but the rigging in spite of all their endeavors was still a mere tangle of useless gearing the sails drew on the jury masts and together with gathering impetus the two vessels moved slowly out into the growing light of the east the wisdom of the efforts of bras de fer in removing to the handier vessel the most movable of the priceless freight was soon apparent for there dull patches upon the southern sky were the sails of two large vessels bearing smartly up under the stress of the fine westerly wind hoarse curses rang forth and fists were wildly brandished towards the approaching ships which as it was plainly to be seen were spanish men of war aroused to alertness by the cannonading at sunset and the night-long flares it would have been hopeless for bras de fer to try and bring both vessels clear away for the unwieldy prize rolled heavily in the rising swell and made scarce a bubble under the forefoot and in her damaged condition with crippled spars and many guns out of service the sally could hardly hope to repeat her success over the san isidro with two war vessels fresh from the havana the weight of argument lay upon the side of his defeat with the loss of all that he had gained there were two alternatives to remain with the san isidro and fight it out to the last or take his prize crew aboard the sally and abandon the san isidro and her prisoners to her compatriots bras de fer chose the latter there was only time to effect the change he called jacquard and his master at arms and the prize crew aboard their own vessel and clapping all sail upon the saucy sally that she could carry in safety sailed clear away and abandoned the huge hulk to the approaching enemy End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Prisoner and Captor. When the heels of the Sally had put so great a distance between herself and her pursuers that there was nothing to fear of their overhauling her, Bras de Fer went below to the cabin exhausted by the events of the night leaning listlessly against the sill of the stern port was mistress clark her lids drooping with weariness as she struggled against tired nature to keep her lone vigil her eyes started wide at the sound of his footsteps she struggled to her feet and stood her face pallid and drawn in the cold garish light of the morning she scanned him eagerly peering fearfully into his face for any portentous sign the dust of battle was still streaked upon it and the shadows under the brows which had made his countenance forbidding in the mad flush of war upon the san isidro 
now only gave the shadows a darker depth of settled melancholy there was a fierceness and wildness too but it was distant hidden and self-contained at bay only with nothing of aggressiveness for immediate apprehension or alarm instead there was a reserved dignity and aloofness which spoke of a nice sense of a delicate situation he made no move to draw near her but stood in the narrow cabin door hat in hand madame is weary he said if you will permit and then he searched the cabin a question in his eyes this senorita madame he asked mistress clark sighed wearily i am alone monsieur she came frozen with terror and fled again you alone i can only crave your pity he peered around at the dingy surroundings i am bereaved madame this cabin is not the san isidro twere better more cleanly i am sorry i had come to order it to your comfort see i have brought your bedding and belongings from the san isidro in a moment if you will permit i can do very much to better your condition a spark of gratitude at this evidence of his kindly disposition gleamed in her eyes a moment and she signed an acquiescence the frenchman conducted her to the half-deck while two negroes sat busily about the place removing his and cornbury's effects and making it sweet and clean for its gentle tenant the frenchman would have left her but mistress barbara stopped him at the cabin door i cannot thank you monsieur to do so pays no jot of my great obligation which every moment becomes greater he bowed and would have passed out you owe me nothing but silence madame he said coldly and that i cannot pay she cried oh why will you not listen to me monsieur have you no kindness i have done what small service i could madame if i owe you more she clenched her small hands together as though in pain ah you do not understand why will you not see it is not that i wish you to do me justice madame justice and i are many miles asunder i have no indulgent memory it is best that there should be no talk of what has been only what is and what is to be has any power to open my ears or my lips and so if you will permit me and once more he made the motion to withdraw it is the present and the future monsieur le chevalier she began but at the sound of that name he turned abruptly towards her frowning darkly it cannot be madame he cried with a brusqueness which frightened her i have no name but bras de fer aboard this ship please address your needs to him she recoiled in dismay in the corner of the bulkhead to listen to the tramp of his heavy sea-boots down the passage for the first time she feared him she could not know that it was the sight of her face and of something new he saw there which raised a doubt that had entered a canker into his mind she could not know what a struggle it was costing him and at what pains he took refuge in the silence he demanded his brutality was but the sudden outward manifestation of this battle which should it not take one side must assuredly take the other he had decided nothing should turn the iron helm of his will but as he sought the deck hot memory poured over him in a flood he recalled the time she had tossed her head at him even before the incident of the coach that too he remembered even with a sense of amusement the coranto and how he had sought to 
patch and mend his wounded pride by fruitlessly assailing hers battering abortively at the citadel of the heart he could never hope to win ferrers the precious papers he had had for a sweet half hour in his bosom and had thrown away where had ferrers hidden them from her the priceless heritage with which he could have daunted this woman enemy of his whom he had loved and hated at the same time and from whom he had received only scorn and misprison could he refuse her now that she was a helpless captive weak frail and unfriended among a crew of rascals who stood at nothing and from whom only himself could preserve her had he not secretly welcomed her wish last night to be carried aboard the saucy sally and the contingency which made it impossible for her to be returned to the san isidro was he not conscious of a sense of guilt that he had not found an opportunity to send her back to safety she was completely in his power his heart sang high but the cord was frayed and the note rang false it was impossible no matter how deeply he had seared his soul no man born as he had been born could refuse the mute appeal of a woman in distress he thought of his dishonour the night he had come upon the saucy sally when in a fury against the fortune which still denied him he had railed madly impotently against all virtue and in a passion of vengefulness sunk so low that he had loudly threatened like a common street ruffian and card-room bully this woman whom god help him he loved and would love throughout all time the depth of his degradation cumbered him about remorse fell upon him and anguish wrung his heart from his body as nothing not even the loss of the papers had done the old life in london with its gaming its carousing and gallantry he could see it all through new eyes washed clean and clear by the purging winds and storms of heaven himself he marked from a great moral distance almost as though from another planet the silly spoiled child of folly that he had been and it was this impotent creature who had cried out against his fate which with a rare honesty had only lowered him from the high estate to which he had won in accordance with the same inexorable regulations of the human law which had raised him there the figures in that london life passed before him like a row of tawdry puppets serving the same martyrdom to folly as himself at the expense of love charity and all true virtue soft thinking for a powder black and bearded filibustier with hands even yet red from his last depredation he smiled supinely to himself that he could think thus of the things that so recently had been his very existence in that london life amid that throng of tinsel goddesses one figure stood eminent and conspicuous it was that of the woman who in all companies of men and women held her fame so fair that whatever their reputations for high deeds or ignoble vices none was so great as she in that great court where virtue was a gem of so little worth that it was kept hid and secret mistress barbara had worn it openly broadly high upon her brow with a rare pride as the most priceless of her inestimable jewels he loved her flaunted scorned despised he loved her the more the past was engulfed and vanquished he only saw her an actuality of the flesh here aboard his very ship the dove in the eagle's nest 
whom every law and impulse human and divine impelled him to succor and protect the vibrant voice the gentle touch the soft perfume of her presence provoked the covetous senses and stole away his will it was with mingled feelings of apprehension and alarm that he discovered to himself the persistency of his attachment he acknowledged it only when he learned that nothing else was possible and when that was done he planned and resolved again with a new fervency of determination the future should atone she had thought him a wild reckless gallant who had won his way and continued to win by his wits a worthless creature who consorted with the worst men of the court and presented in the world the characteristics she most despised how he hated the thing that he had been the mask that he had worn if she had cared she could have seen she would have learned that he was not all that she had thought him the reckless gallant was become a rough buccaneer and pirato she had seen him in the red fever of battle eh bien he would not undeceive her red-handed pirato he would remain no glimpse should she have of the struggle beneath he would set her safe ashore at port royal he would sail away from her for ever and she should enjoy her fortune that was the price that he would pay none the less he found the occasion to wash away the stains of battle and in fresh linen and hose became less offensive to the sight when he sought the deck there was no sign of a vessel upon any side cornbury he found at the after hatch puffing upon a pipe oh hon dear iron arm the irishman began ye are the anomalous figure of a parato to be sure one minute your form is painted broad upon the horizon with a cutlass in your teeth and glistening pikes in both your fists in the next you are playing the hero part of virtue in distress bras de fer smiled oh ye may laugh but in truth tis almost irregular ye violate every tradition of the trade by the laws ye are no decent figure of a swashbuckler at all at all what would ye have then mon ami ay he's clean daffy what would i have bah ye know my misliking for the sex and ye ask me what would i have egad a walk on the plank and a little dance on nothing would not be amiss for her tis the simplest thing in the world the least bit of a rope three ten pound shot a shove of the arm and psh your troubles are sunk in a mile of sea to england a treaty of peace with captain Ferrers, and voila you're a french viscount with a fortune beyond the dreams of avarice and an out at the knees and elbows of an irishman to help you spend it man tis a squandering waste of opportunity he growled and puffed upon his pipe sending crabbed sour glances at his captain oh ye may laugh instead of this what ye do ye have my lady aboard the ship to the perversion of all decent piratical society give her my bed and board and my particular nigger for waiting man yes so in the seeds of ripe mutiny may handsome picaroon and a red-headed irishman will be there to aid in the blossoming nay cornbury said bras de fer we do but go a short cruise to port royal i've set my mind on seeing my lady safe in english hands there you are fumed the irishman there you are 
You'll kill the golden goose. You'll jeopardize your calling again. All for that same finical bundle of superficialities. Slapped once in the face, you turn your cheek with new avidity for more. Zounds, I've no patience with such shilly shallying. And as Broad Affair was silent, he sent forth a quick succession of smoke puffs, which chased madly down the wind. Ask Jacquard, he growled again. He likes it no more than I. There's a muttering forward. Tis discipline, the lack of drink, and an unequal partitioning of the spoils. Par Dieu, interrupted the Frenchman at last, his eyes flashing in a fury. Do they growl? Let them do it in the forecastle. No man, no, not even you shall beard me on my quarter deck. Conberry did not arise or show the least sign of a changed countenance. As Jacquard, he repeated again. Bras de Fer swung hotly on his heel and went below. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur Learns Something. When the night had fallen again, Mistress Barbara Clark went timorously upon the deck in search of Bras de Fer. His insensibility and brutality in turning away from her, when she would have spoken to him in the cabin, had tried her to the last extremity. But the thought of the duty she owed herself and him stifled the impulses of her spirit, and her pride, rebellious and insensate that the man who had so frankly sacrificed himself in London should care so little here, impelled her inevitably her fear of him was short-lived in spite of all she knew to his discredit and the bloody guise in which she had found him that look of humiliation and distress which she had brought into his face a night so long ago remained ineffaceably written upon her memory it spoke better than all the proofs she had discovered of the wrong that had been done him she found him by the light of a lantern directing the repair of a gun carriage upon the poop she addressed him timidly monsieur bras de fer she began he raised his head and turned abruptly towards her and the sense of security from rebuke she had counted upon in the presence of the men fled away at the sight of his frowning countenance what are you doing here madame he said harshly the deck is no place for you go below at once or but with never a glance at the grinning fellows at her elbow she looked him steadily in the eyes as she replied with a will and a spirit which surprised even herself i shall not monsieur the voice was low and even but the small hands were clenched her head was tossed a little upon one side and every line of her lithe body which swung rhythmically to the motion of the sliding deck spoke of invincible courage and determination bras de fer scowled darkly a moment and even took a step in her direction but she stood undaunted with an assumption of carelessness he waved his hands and presently they were alone i thank you for that condescension she said at last speak your will quickly madame i am in a place of business you must hear me to the end monsieur no matter what ma foi madame he sneered is it you who command the ship or i if there is aught you require say on if not you will go below at once you must hear me monsieur madame he scowled and spoke with a studied brutality is it not enough that i have done your will once i am taking you to safety try me not too far or 
you may find reason to regret your presumption and as she shrank a little away from him what have you to expect from me by what right do you seek me or ask me any favour by the right of a gentle birth if not by that by the right of a decent humanity he laughed with an assumption of coarseness which sat strangely upon him and have you no fear mistress clark does your instinct teach you no tremor he moved a pace nearer and glanced down upon her do you not see proud woman have you no trembling no terror at the sight of me am i so gentle so tractable so ingenuous that you can defy me with impunity you are in my power there is no one to say me nay what is there to prevent me doing with you as i will she had not moved back from him the distance of a pace and it was his eye that first fell before hers you will doubtless do your will she said evenly but i cannot find it in my heart to fear you monsieur and the quietude of her reliance paled his mock brutality into a mere silly effusiveness at the sight of you monsieur she continued there is little room for fear in my breast no even if you should strike me down here upon this foreign friendless deck i believe that i could raise no hand or voice in protest madame he said it is true you are powerless to offend why your threats are mere empty vaunts monsieur even in this dusky light i can see it in your eyes you are clean of evil intent as a babe unborn bras de fer bowed his head oh let me right the great wrong that has been done it is impossible when you learn listen oh listen monsieur she cried passionately as he moved away when you learn that i have left london for you that i have given up all i possessed that a great wrong might be righted a great martyrdom ended you will no longer refuse me the words came tumbling forth any way from her lips in a mad haste that he might hear before he was gone out of earshot and as he paused to listen fearfully yes yes monsieur i have learned she cried again i know it is yours it is all yours bras de fer turned his body towards her again but as he faced her his head was still bowed in his shoulders and she could see no other sign of any emotion the revelation that he had longed for and feared because he longed for it so much was made the secret was out however he planned and whatever guise of unfriendliness he took the relations between himself and this woman were changed thenceforward the struggle for the mastery was fierce as it was brief and in that moment no matter how changed his duty to himself and her he resolved that she should have no sign of it when he raised his head again to the lantern light all trace of the storm that had passed over his spirit was gone it is too late madame he muttered too late i stand by the cast of the die you cannot know what you say monsieur if the estates do not go to you they will go to no one it is the end of the house of de brezac your fortune your titles your honours and my good name he asked coldly who will restore to me my good name no i shall not return to london madame you must return she broke in wildly it is a sacred duty if not for yourself for the blood that runs in our veins the phrase sang sweet in his ears but he gave no sign blood is thicker than water but it seeks its level as surely i have made my bed 
i shall sleep no less soundly because it is a rough one she struggled to contain the violence of her emotion no no it cannot be it must not be you will learn how i have striven for you you cannot refuse it would be cruel inhuman monstrous mistress clark has much to learn of the inhumanities he said and then with cool composure what power availed to convince her where monsieur mornay was so unfortunate you are cruel cruel what had you to expect of me what had you done in london to merit my favour why should i have believed in one of whom i knew nothing nothing but presumption and indignity how should i have known madame's advisers do not speak of them she interrupted it is past the proofs were brought me that is all why need you know more captain ferrers he said insinuatingly yes he she drew herself to her full height and he could not fail to mark the lofty look of scorn that curved her lips and brow all london learned of the story of your escape my agents were told that the vessel upon which you had fled was in the american trade and so i sought service where i might best reach you thank god my quest has not been in vain madame sought service he said in a wonder which vied with his cold assumption of apathy i sought service with the senorita de batteville monsieur she continued with a proud lift of the chin in the capacity of a waiting woman and duenna the words fell with cruel import upon his ears he could hardly believe that he had heard aright you serve he stammered have i not said that every lever of my fortune yes but madame to serve you it is so strange would you have me take that which is not mine no monsieur i am no thief bras de fer had turned resolutely towards the bulwarks with a mind more turbulent even than the seething waters below him in the turmoil of his emotions he knew not which way to turn what to say or what to do the plan that he had marked for himself was becoming every moment less and less distinct it was with an effort that he turned towards her his resolution giving him an implacability he was far from feeling madame your probity does you credit were your judgment as unerring as your honesty i had not left london as it is i've no mind to return monsieur she faltered monsieur if you please madame i would have you below it is a rough crew and i'll not answer for them but you will tell me madame you've purged your conscience there your duty ends at port royal it shall be arranged that you are sent to porto bello as for me my will is made ah you are malignant she cried with a flash of spirit his cold sinister eyes sinking and piercing deep into her heart like cold steel you are not he whom i have sought he was frank generous kind a strange bitter monstrous creature has grown in his guise her voice trembled and broke as she moved to the hatchway may god help you she said in a kind of sobbing whisper who have so little kindness and pity for others and in a moment she had faded a slender shrinking shade of sorrow from his vision when she was gone he fell upon the bulwarks and buried his face in his hands ah bon dieu he murmured how could i do it she who has been so kind so kind the new delight that swept over him at the thought of all that this rare and sweet woman had done for him came over him in a delicious flush which drove away the pallor of his distemper like the warm glow of the tropics upon the frozen north the heavy burden of his melancholy was lifted 
if he crept about with bowed head now it was because of some failing of the spirit or some craven dishonor of his own he and his were forever raised to high estate and no careless proscription of his inconsequent mistress fate could cast him down again the freedom of his soul from the blight which his birth had put upon it lent it wings to soar gladly into the wide empyrean of his imagination and he gave himself up without stint to the new joy in their motion did he wish he could go at once to london and take a place among the men of his kind a place which no mere art could win for him to london there was a time when that word was magic for him when in careless bravado he was challenging his fortune to deny him what he wished now he wondered at the singular distaste which grew at the very thought of the life that had been with such a fortune and such a name there were no favors or honors he could not buy he would know how to win his way again but his spirit was listless at the thought with the joy at his freedom from the cloud of his birth his pleasure ended the estates his titles and honors dwelt so little in his mind that he marveled again at his change of disposition he could go to london but at what cost summon the goddesses of his past as he might their essenced wiles and specious blandishings distance gave them no added charm he could only see this pale proud woman with a rare and imperturbable honesty which showed how justly she had won the honors she relinquished in a pure nobility which brought a flush to his cheek giving up without a qualm or faltering the life and habits the high condition to which she had been born and in which she had been so carefully nurtured could he go back to london to leave this woman a wanderer a servant whose only hope even for a bare existence lay in the bounty of a spaniard the thought grew upon him and oppressed him and drove all the joy from his heart all this she had done for him for him he rolled the thought over and over in his mind like a sweetmeat in the mouth with a new taste of delicacy and delight at every turn she had given it all for him that he the man she had affected so profoundly to despise might be exalted it was not a triumph but a quiet joy the joy that the sick feel at the touch of a ministering angel it did not matter what the cause whether she had made this sacrifice for the principal or whether she had made it for the individual he was the cause of this great outflow of human kindness and self-sacrifice from the deep warm well-springs of this wonderful woman's heart which he had so often sought to reach and sought in vain the glimmer of a single tear which had trembled a moment upon her cheek in the lantern light reached to the very quick of the unrevealed secret depths of his nature where no plummet had ever before sounded it had glistened a jewel more inestimable than all the wealth she had brought him could he leave this woman upon the world at the mercy of every bitter occasion he had chosen wisely red-handed buccaneer he would remain he would not undeceive her the light in which she held him removed all chance of an understanding he would set her safely ashore at portobello then with the aid of cornbury and the english government 
so dispose of his affairs that the fortune would revert to her in case of his death whether she willed it or no then he would set to sea and take the precaution to die as speedily and publicly as might be so far as she was concerned that would be the end he would see england no more it was here that his talents found their readiest employment of all his fortune he would take only the ship upon which he sailed and under another name which would serve his purposes as adequately as the one he now bore he would continue as he had begun with a wider license only a free trader a picaroon a pirato if you will it was jacquard who broke without ceremony upon his meditations monsieur le capitaine he began with an air of some brusqueness oh jacquard he replied abstractedly are we well repaired monsieur it is not that for some days i have wished to see you there is a muttering in the forecastle yon gratz ah well monsieur there is nothing upon the surface from outward view tis placid as a pond but i know i have ears upon all sides of my head tis yon gratz you've set his value too low gratz will not forget the leopard spots upon him like the leopard he will bite and as stealthily he will crawl pardieu jacquard is it so bras de fer lifted his brows and what is the grievance now jacquard scratched his great nose in perplexity before he replied it is the discipline he began slowly the discipline which has wearied them they have little rum to drink two tins yesterday one tin to-day and lastly monsieur will pardon me lastly monsieur this matter of the lady prisoner monsieur they say jacquard it is enough he interrupted you need say no more you may tell them that upon this saucy sally i command if there is grumbling let them come to me openly at the mast and not skulk like cats in the dark if monsieur will permit i would think it better what you too jacquard why tis a very honeycomb of faithlessness monsieur monsieur cried jacquard in an agony of awkward anguish you know that that is not so monsieur it is not so i am but giving my opinion it would be wise to notice them there is yet time to set the lady upon a vessel it shall not be jacquard we sail straight forth into the broad ocean and then by way of the wide passage of porto rico west to port royal in jamaica that is my plan it is unalterable if we happen upon spanish prizes so much the better we shall take them but we shall seek none and as for the lady she shall be set ashore upon jamaica and not upon any passing ship jacquard whose jaw had dropped and whose face had been growing longer and longer during this recital burst forth at last mais monsieur he cried it is unwise to taunt them so the spanish ships are thick about us in another month the carrying will be less it is the time of times their blood is hot with victory bras de fer broke in with an oath it will be cold with death if they balk me 
if Jan Gratz has aught to say, let him come forth like a man, and then with a smile. Perhaps he has the stomach for a little play upon the pike. Monsieur, he will not come. He fears you like the plague. He will do his work the more effectively in quiet. Bras de Fer paused a moment and then came to Jacquard and put both hands upon his shoulders. Mon ami, he said, what you ask is impossible. It is impossible. I give you my word. If I could do what you advise, I should do so. For what you urge is wise. But I must try to do what I have planned to do. If I cannot do it with you, I must do it without you. Oh, monsieur, interrupted Jacquard, almost at the edge of tears. I would do for you always speak for you work for you fight for you and now do not doubt me monsieur the appeal shone forth with so true a light from his small glittering eyes that bras de fer was truly affected by the demonstration i believe you mon ami go tell me all that happens i will follow your advice as I can. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Love of Monsieur by George Gibbs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva The Unmasking Mistress Barbara reached her cabin door free save for that rebellious tear which the frenchman had seen of any outward mark of the turbulence of her emotions but once within and the key turned in the lock she buried her face in her hands her frame racked by hard dry sobs which filled her throat and overwhelmed her fearful that the sounds might reach the ears of him who had caused them she clenched her teeth upon her kerchief wrapped her cloak closely about her neck and face and threw herself upon the bench in an agony of mortification god help her had it all been in vain she had sought the man she had found him and he had repulsed her unkindly even cruelly as though she had been a foolish child or a daughtered a person unworthy of consideration was this the one she had known in london the gallant chevalier mornay who however bold and daring carried forward his presumptions with a grace and courtesy which robbed them of their offensiveness she might acknowledge this now that he was grown so different what had come over him was he mad he had repulsed her as though she sought to do him an injury had spoken to her as she had heard him speak to the vile creatures about him in a tone which lowered her to their own level he had spurned her scorned her lightly carelessly coolly as though even his scorn were too valuable an emotion to squander upon one he held in such a low estimation never had she been treated thus by man or woman and her gorge rose at the thought of it the sobbing ceased and in place of her distress came an unreasoning quiet fury fury at herself at him at the world which had brought her to such a pass she rose and angrily brushing the wet straggling hair from her eyes threw wide the stern casement to look out on the grey turmoil of the waters which vanished into the unseen was this the man for whom she had left london and sacrificed everything was this fool who threw her favours aside like a tarnished ribbon 
was this the man who had followed her about from place to place in london seeking to win her by the same bold methods he had used with other women fawning yes fawning for a look or a glance which he might read to his advantage she laughed aloud ah he had found none no sign not the faintest quiver of an eyelid had she ever given him nor even dignified him by her righteous anger until that night in the garden at dorset house when by a trick he had taken her unawares to the end that her lofty disdain had given way to an active breathing hatred then when she had learned that the man was no impostor but her own kinsman of whose martyrdom she had been unwittingly the cause pity had taken the place of scorn contrition the place of vengefulness compassion the place of hate the damp night wind touched her cheek and brow the lustre died out of her eyes her lips parted and the deep intaking of breath and trembling sigh bespoke the passing of the emotion a surrender was he not moving strictly within the letter of his rights could she expect him to come flying on the wings of ardency at the mere crooking of her finger search her heart as she might she could find no anger there of that she was sure no matter how great the rebellion of her spirit against his cool impenetrability she knew better than any words could tell that had he been precipitate in response to her news and her petitions she must have been as stone to his advances but he wore his armor so well that her woman's weapons needed all their burnishing she was conscious even of a sense of guilt the noble sentiments which had sent her forth upon this wild chase across half the world were suborned to the feminine appetite for tribute withheld the woman in her saw only her natural enemy man rebellious and declaring war who must at all hazards be brought into subjection it might be possible and yet she doubted she could not understand one moment he was masterful in a way which thrilled her in another the eyes would reveal that which no tangling or knitting of the brows or thinning of the lips could belie had she rightly read him she could not forget that she had surprised him in his subterfuges that in spite of herself and him she could not fear him what if she dared not think was the love which this man's eyes had spoken to her so great as this could it be that her fate was ever cruelly to misjudge him was there something finer in his life than she had ever known in another's something that she could not learn of or understand she trembled a little and drew the casement in the lantern was flickering dimly casting strange patches of shadow which danced upon the beams and bulkhead if monsieur loved her she would learn it from his own lips if this were so and she had not read him amiss twas but a paltry excuse for a man of his birth and attainments to throw away his life at this wild calling to the end that a silly person who merited nothing might continue to enjoy the benefits he could thus relinquish he should not leave her again at whatever cost he must return to london the estates were his and nothing save his death could give her any right to them she was warm and cold by turns she must gain time to win him over dissimulate deceive him if necessary 
it might perhaps be accomplished a look or a gesture a speech with a hidden meaning however at variance with the fact which might give him hope that she was no longer indifferent to him then perhaps she might draw aside the mask he would be tractable and perhaps even pliant ah she must act well her part with all her subtle woman's weapons of offence conceal her feelings however at variance with the actual performance that he might not question her integrity he was clever and keen it would call for all the refinements of her arts were she not to throw a depth of meaning into her play of the role he would learn of the fraud and all her labors would be at naught despicable as this task would be what could be more despicable than mock coquetry she must go through it in the same spirit with which she had entered upon this quest there would be no need of course to promise anything what would there be to promise and when the time was come she could go out of his life as speedily as she had come into it far into the night she thought and planned while she watched the guttering lamps and the wavering shadows until at last weariness fell heavily upon her eyelids and she slept the cabin was a flood with light when she awoke there was a sound of rushing feet overhead the clatter of heavy boots and the rattle of blocks and spars hoarse orders rang forward and aft and the very air seemed to quiver with import deep down in the bowels of the vessel below her she heard the jangling of arms and the jarring of heavy objects she started up half in wonder half in fear and rushed to the port by the bulkhead there the reason for this ominous activity was apparent not a league distant under the lee was a large vessel under full press of canvas fleeing for her life was evident that the saucy sally had crept near her during the night and the laggard spaniard unaware of the nationality or dangerous character of his neighbor had permitted her to come close until the full light of day had convinced him of his error that he was making a valiant effort to repair it was evident in the way the vessel was heeling to the wind and the lashing of the amber foam into which she frantically swam in her mad struggle to win clear away but even mistress barbara's untutored eye could see that the effort was a vain one for the slipping seas went hurrying past the sally's quarter with a rush which sent them speedily astern to mingle with the dancing blue line which marked the meeting of the sky and sea the intention of the sally was soon apparent a crash split mistress barbara's ears and set her quivering with fear flight was impossible and so in a ferment of terror yet fascinated she watched the shot go flying towards the luckless fugitive it was not until then that the real danger of her situation became apparent a cloud of white floated away from the spaniard's stern she saw no shot nor heard any sound of its striking but she knew that monsieur had wilfully gone into action and heedlessly exposed her to the shocks of war had he no kindness no clemency or compassion was it after all a mistake that she should have given this man her solicitude and confidence a knock at the door fell almost as loudly upon her ears as the crash of ordnance had done when a second and sharper knock resounded she summoned her voice to answer madame it is i came in low tones from without if you can find it convenient to open at the sound of the voice she gained courage monsieur had come to her 
trembling yet still undismayed she crept to the door and opened it the face of the frenchman was dark and impassive if the night had brought a new resolution to her it was plain that monsieur was in no wise different from yesterday all this she noted while her hand still clung falteringly to the knob of the door madame he began the matter is most urgent if it will please you to follow me mistress barbara with difficulty found her tongue where monsieur what madame i pray that you will make haste there is little time to lose i should be at this moment upon the deck monsieur would take me below the water-line madame there will be a fight shots may be fired i would have you in safety alas for mistress barbara's crafty plans and gentle resolutions in a moment they were dissipated by the imperturbability the tepid indifference of his manner which should have been so different in the face of a situation which promised so much that was ominous to her his coolness fell about her like a bucket of water and sent a righteous anger to her rescue so that her chill terror was driven forth for the nonce by a flush of hot blood when she spoke her voice rang clear with a certain bitter courage safety she cried monsieur is too kind i shall prefer to be killed here here in the decent privacy of the cabin madame said he in impatience it is no time for delay there must be no obstacle to your obedience she looked at him in angry wonder if this were mock insult it had too undisguised a taste to be quite palatable monsieur she said stamping her foot in a rage i go nowhere for you nowhere i will die before i follow you battle or no battle here i shall remain am i a lackey or a woman of all work that you order me thus safety if you value my safety why do you permit them to make war over my very head no no you are transparent a very tissue of falsities i read you as an open book monsieur she paused a moment for lack of breath i do not believe in you how do you repay me for what i have done refuse me deny me and order me about like a wilful child with your insolent glare and your cool puckered brow what is my safety to you i do not believe madame you must come at once never she cried never no power shall move me from the spot nothing at this moment a crash ten times more dreadful than the first shook the vessel like a hundred thunderbolts cornbury in blissful ignorance of the battle raging below had opened the battle above with the entire starboard broadside mistress barbara stammered faltered and fell back towards the table trembling with fear she put her hands to her ears as though to blot out the sounds and then in a supplicating dependence which set at naught all the hot words that had poured from her lips she leaned forward listlessly upon the table take me she said brokenly take me i am all humility i will go monsieur a soft light she had seen there before crept into the eyes of bras de fer as though unconscious she saw his extended arms thrust forward to her support and heard as from a distance the resonant voice the notes of which with a strange sweet insistence sang among her emotions until like lute-strings they sang and trembled in return and the chord which they awoke to melody rang through every fibre of her being with a new pulsing joy a splendid delight like the full-throated song of praise of a bird at early morn she felt his hand seek hers she made no move to resist him 
she could not something in the break of his voice the reverence in his touch sought and subdued her in a moment she learned that the love of a life had come and that all else was as nothing barbara barbara he was saying look at me cherie tell me that you are not angry i have tried so hard to leave you so hard i have spoken to you bitterly and coldly that your mind might be poisoned and frozen against me that you might hate and despise me for the unworthy thing that i am alas it is my own heart that i have pierced and broken look up at me barbara i cannot bear to see you thus ah if you had only opposed me in anger i could have continued the deception your anger was my refuge it was the only thing that made my cruelty possible i cried aloud like a naked sword i welcomed it and set steel upon steel that i might shield my heart but now listless yielding submissive you disarm me you rob me of my only weapon i am yours do with me what you will his voice trembled and he bent his head upon her hand to hide the excess of his emotion as she felt the touch of his lips she started and moved ever so slightly but with no effort to withdraw when he lifted his head it was to meet eyes that wavered and looked away do not turn from me barbara do not add to the deep measure of my contrition the cup is full add to it but one drop and it will overflow requite me with tenderness madame if you can find it in your heart for mine is very near to breaking look in my eyes where my love glows like a beacon listen and you will hear it speak in my voice like a young god can you not feel my very fingertips singing into your palms the cadences of my heart's chorus is it not thus that women wish to be loved search my heart as you will you'll find an answer there to every wish and every prayer she trembled and swayed in his arms like a slender shrub in a storm it seemed as though in his fervor he were running the gamut of her every vulnerable sensibility but as she felt his breath warm upon her hair and cheek she raised her eyes until they looked into his then drew away from him with a gentle firmness she was perturbed and shaken with the compounding of new emotions she could not see all things clearly she only knew that uh, what she had expected least had come to pass she had burnished her woman's weapons in vain she had sought to delude and beguile and had only deluded and beguiled herself as she had promised herself she had drawn aside the mask but she had unmasked herself at the same time she had sought and she had found so many things that she knew not which way to turn she must do something to gain time to think and plan it was all so different to london in spite of herself she knew that he had conquered and a suffusion of shame that she had been so easily won mounted to her neck and forehead and she turned her head away and then in a last obedience to that instinct of self-preservation which sets a woman upon the defensive when she knows not what she would defend nor would defend it if she could she broke away from him and stood alone pulsing with the effort but triumphant monsieur she breathed with difficulty it is unfair to to press me so but he was relentless ah madame am i then despised as on that night in dorset gardens nay 
I am as God made me, not the thing you would have supposed. Monsieur, have pity. Ah, then look at me again, Barbara. Look in my face and deny. Look in my eyes, Cherie. Deny me if you can. She felt his arms encircle her, and she struggled faintly. No, no, it is not so. Look me in the eyes, Barbara. I will not believe it else. If I am nothing to you, look me in the eyes and tell me so. No, no, no. She raised her face until her closed eyes were on a level with his own. Then she opened them with an effort to look at him as though to speak. A deafening crash again shook the sally, so that the ship's dry bones rattled and quivered under their feet like a being with the ague, and she seemed about to shake her timbers asunder. Mistress Barbara's answer was not spoken, for at this rude sound a fit of trembling seized her again, and she sank listlessly into the protecting shelter of his arms, and hid her face upon his bosom in a commingling of terror and wonderment that were only half real. No, no, she sobbed at last. It is not true. It is not true. Broad affair bent over her in a blind adoration and gently touched his lips to her hair she made no further effort to resist him then when the tear-stained face was raised to his own in her eyes he read a different answer to his pleading bien adore he whispered kissing her tenderly barbara the hand within his own tightened and the lissom figure came closer to his own take me away monsieur she murmured take me away oh i am so weary so weary struggle no more he whispered courage all will yet be well come with me below to safety and it will soon be over he had moved away from her towards the door and would have withdrawn his hand but she held it with both of her own while her eyes looked into his with an anxious query oh i he said with a smile i shall be in no danger madame that i promise you tis but a spanish merchant man with little skill in war why sally will run her aboard in the skipping of a shot and now as they moved towards the door but a little while and i shall be with you again to keep guard over your door to keep guard upon you always always end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Mutiny. She summoned all her courage, and Bras de Fer led her forward along the passage upon the deck to the other hatch. Jan Gratz, Jacquard, and the crew were crowded at the broadside guns, and at the sight of Monsieur, the Dutchman's face broke into a pasty smile as he sneered to his neighbor was this a ship or vital palace but splits and he spat demonstratively but broad the fair was handing my lady down the hatch into the afterhold with a gesture into which he put even more of a manner than the occasion demanded jacquard had gone down before with a lighted lantern and had unfastened the hatch of the lazaretto the opening of which made a murky patch in the obscurity mistress barbara shuddered a little and drew back but the strong arm of monsieur encircled her waist his firm hand reassured her own and his low voice spoke in even accents these are chests of gold and silver jewels and silks madame and then it is here that we keep 
our priceless captures he whispered smiling sit in comfort the water line is above where you see the beams o'erhead in a little while i will come again and all will be way he pressed the trembling hand in both his own and she saw him follow the long figure of jacquard who with sympathy and discretion of which his glum demeanour gave no indication had left the light hanging to a timbre and gone growling above alone with the swaying lantern the beams and bulkheads the boxes and chests she gave herself over to her own turbulent reflections there was a swish and hollow gurgle at her very ear as the seas alongside washed astern a creaking and a groaning of the timbers which made her tremble for the staunchness of the vessel the boxes and chests resolved themselves into great square patches of light which thrust their staring presence forward obtrusively and the vagrant diagonal shadow took a new direction and meaning in the misty darkness beyond the sphere of light at each new posture of the vessel strange odors musty dry and evil smelling afflicted her nostrils and the air hot and fetid hung about her and upon her offensively breathing became a muscular exertion and an effort of the will she bit her lip and clenched her hands upon the chest where she was seated to keep from crying aloud her misery and terror suddenly there was a sound of rending and tearing among the complaining timbers and the guns above renewed their angry threats one two three four single discharges she heard a scattering broadside and then silence again that chorus of unfamiliar sounds each one of which spoke to her in a different way of danger in some new and dreadful form presently the clamorous sea sang a louder wilder note the timbers cried aloud in their distress the lantern swung sharply in abrupt and shortening circles and the shadows like arms thrust out at her from the unseen and filled her with a new and nameless terror the motion of the vessel was sickening and the black noisome air from which there was no escape seemed to fill her very brain and poison her faculties with a blind effort she arose and in a fright at she knew not what crept up the ladder to the hatch it were better to die the death at once than to be poisoned by inches she drank gratefully of the purer air above her and listened to the sounds of shouting from the deck there was a shock and crash as the ships came together and then all sounds save at intervals were lost in the grinding of the vessels and the roar of the sea between she heard several shots as though at a great distance but these were as nothing after the noise of the great guns and she almost smiled as she thought how easily the victory was accomplished and he had monsieur come off free of harm she trembled a little at the thought of it and yet even the trembling had in it something of a new and singular delight with her eyes free to roam in the grey of the half-deck where there was air if ever so faint and the sweet smell of the sea she thought no more of herself the silence above boded no ill she heard nothing but the wash of the sea alongside the creaking and clatter of blocks on the deck 
and the crunch of the ships to the roll of the sea at last the sound of voices was nearer and louder whether in anger fear or pleasure she could not discover then the tramping of heavy boots and the rushing of men forward and aft but no sound of shot or clash of steel to remind her of her continued jeopardy five ten minutes she listened all her faculties alert for the sound of his voice the grinding of the vessel ceased and when the main deck hatch was removed she could hear quite plainly the sounds upon the deck the voices of men in fierce disputation fell hollowly down through a crack in the narrow aperture one was thin and small like that of a child another was heavy and gruff and cursed volubly in french sharper tones rang between and through it all the roar or continuous murmur of a crowd something had fallen amiss she was sure suddenly as though a spell had fallen upon their tongues the clamour was hushed and in the brief second of desperation the sea noises about her sang loudly in her ears which strained to catch every sound at last a single voice slow calm dispassionate began to speak it was his she emerged upon the half-deck in order that nothing of what was passing might escape her and leaned upon the ladder looking to where the daylight flickered down your humour is changed wondrously mes amis you ask many things not the least of which is this spaniard's death you young grads and you bartier troc and ducnois you craik and goetz stand aside i grant nothing nothing where i see the gleam of a weapon naked sheathe your cutlasses and stand aside then maybe we shall see there was an ominous movement of scraping feet a clatter of weapons and then a hoarse turmoil a very bedlam of sounds a wild scratching and scuffling upon the deck and hoarse dreadful cries savage and fierce like the bark of hungry dogs yet with its ringing accompaniment of clanging steel infinitely more terrible half mad with the terror at this struggle of which she could see nothing faint and weak with the accumulation of her distresses she hung more dead than alive to the companion ladder in one moment shutting her ears to the mad din above her in another listening eagerly for the broken fragments of sound fearful that the end of all things might come in one of those merciful moments in which she heard nothing she thrust her hand into her breast and pulled forth the slender petronel which she had brought from the san isidro she looked at the shining barrel and saw to the flint and charge there should be no hesitation if monsieur but no no he was there yet she heard his voice strong valiant ringing like a clarion above the medley aha cornberry it cried point in edge mon ami your pupils are too apt monsieur le maître d'armes a crake would you voilà touchez de couloir touchez mais ce n'est rien où il struck cornberry jacquard help us coquin to the rail back to back we will drive them into the sea the rushing feet clattered over her head and she heard the sound of his voice no more she wondered whether it was because it rang no more that she did not hear it or whether her terror and her weakness had deprived her of her senses the seconds grew into hours 
broken cries and curses in strange harsh voices came to her again and she knew that she heard aright the sound of blows the hard breathing of men all swallowed in the many noises of combat and at the last the fall of something muffled heavy and resistless upon the deck came with a new and dreadful portent to her ears she stifled the shriek which rose to her lips and pressed her hands to her bosom to still its tremors that dull echoless sound could have but one meaning she stood inert her mind and body things apart she could not bring herself into accord with the too obtrusive fact and wondered aimlessly that her ear caught at the cries of the complaining timbers and rush of water alongside rather than at the vortex of her life's tragedy which whirled just at her elbow and thus in a merciful tampering of her spirit to the occasion she hung swaying to the ladder her mind gaining a cool and purposeful self-possession which was to nerve her frail body to further efforts if monsieur were dead then she had but to die also she knew that she must keep her strength for if she lost consciousness they would come below and find her and when she awoke alive and alone upon this horrible ship the thought gave a new life to her energies and she determined to put an end at once to the uncertainty anything were better than the suspense which each moment made the danger of weakness more imminent step by step she crept up the staggering ladder until her head had reached the level of the hatch above then she pushed aside the covering and the pistolet in her nerveless fingers peered forth upon deck joy gave her new strength and energy there against the bulwarks pale and breathless but erect and strong with the light of battle still undiminished in his eyes was bras de fer while around him in a wide snarling circle were a dozen of the wolves of the saucy sally ready to spring in upon him and yet each fearful to be the first to bite there was the smell of rum in the air and a broken cask told a part of the cause of the difficulty upon the deck curious loose distortions made a ghastly parody of the flesh which they had been all these things she noted in a glance but her eyes fell instinctively upon the figure of a tall man the one who had lighted her below who was brandishing his arms not at monsieur but towards a stout man in baggy breeches who stood defiantly blinking at him raising first a pistol and then a sword towards bras de fer in a manner not to be misinterpreted here was the key to the situation he was not then quite alone but as she looked a thrill of horror came over her two men fell upon the tall man from behind and seized his arms then the fat man leaned forward towards monsieur with an oily vicious smile he said nothing at all but keeping his sword in front of him with his left hand slowly and with grim deliberation raised his pistol into a line barbara's wild cry rang from one end of the deck to the other regardless of her own danger and scarce responsible she was flying across the intervening space towards jan gratz the startled dutchman disconcerted for a moment by this unfamiliar sound turned his mouth agape 
his pistol pointing purposeless at the empty air stop she cried supremely imperious yet affrighted at the sound of her own voice stop you must not i command you jan graz paused uncertain for a moment he looked at this gentle adversary as though he did not know whether to scowl or laugh then his lumpy face broke into a smile and his lifted brows puckered his forehead into innumerable wrinkles the pistol dropped to his side oh you you command me he began wagging his head but who in the name of god was you then for the first time his eye fell upon the pistolet which mistress barbara still held tightly clutched in her extended hand in her solicitude for monsieur she had forgotten herself and the weapon which now still unconsciously she pointed directly at the portly person of jan gratz he stammered and fell back a pace in amazement the diversion was sufficient for by this time jacquard had struggled to his feet and throwing aside the fellows who were holding him had rushed in and seized the pistol from the hand of the dutchman before he could use it at the same moment bras de fer with a fierce cry had sprung forward among the amazed mutineers and had taken barbara under the cover of his weapon listen me camarade roared jacquard above the confusion waving the pistol in wide commanding circles listen me brave and you will not regret listen i say it is i jacquard who speaks wait but a moment and hear me listen and when i am done you will say old jacquard is wise his ungainly figure towered before them the swinging arms like great wings the hooked brows and curved beak making him look not unlike some gigantic bird of prey ready at a moment to fall upon any who denied him at last such was his influence that they were brought to a measure of calmness then with crafty deliberation he began to speak ah mes galons we have hunted together long you and i and we have hunted well last year you drank or spent or gamed a thousand pounds away to-day the hold and lazaretto of old sally are full of spanish silks and laces and plate for the selling in port royal are other ships which will yield ye more and you will sacrifice these ships and these cargoes and all the money they bring to you many cries arose the loudest of which was that of jan gratz sacrifice these ships shanky chacal by god it is a lie verdomt it is so mates i will swear it kill monsieur yonder and not one shilling from the ships do you get why in port royal monsieur showed his warrant to the governor the governor has a certain share in the takings from the isidro twill be a strange tale ye tell if bras de fer comes not back with the ship the master at arms ye've killed if i mistake not he's captain in his majesty's guards perhaps ye can explain that anxious glances passed among the rascals as they looked first at monsieur and then at jacquard 
but young gratz was not to be deceived or robbed of his vengeance donnerwetter he cried ay ay what difference it makes de warrant is de warrant of billy finch no other i am as good a man as him thunder of ter teufel i will make a call myself upon the governor of jamaica in answer to this sally jacquard burst into a loud laugh ha ha you swelled out of all proper dimensions young gratz ye forget that monsieur the governor and monsieur bras de fer are friends listen then to what i propose bras de fer will write us a letter saying that you or i may receive the ships uh, for our owners in return we will give monsieur and madame the pinnace and let them go whither they will no by god roared gratz furious at being balked of his vengeance he shall not get away from me there was a mingling of opinions loudly and profanely expressed and it looked for the moment as though the strife would be renewed jan gratz dutchman stood by him to a man and while the gleaming sword and pistolet of monsieur held them at a safe distance they sought by their shouting of wild threats to make up for their other deficiencies barbara hid behind bras de fer sought valiantly to match her courage to his but with pale face and quaking limbs she awaited the decision upon which rested his life or death and hers it mattered little which it was to be she had suffered so much that anything anything which brought rest would be welcome but monsieur had lost no whit of his aggressiveness if he was silent it was because silence was best with a keen eye he noted the effect of the speech of jacquard he saw that his compatriot had chosen wisely in leaving his sword undrawn thus jacquard retained his influence with the crew whose sympathy and arms he could not have swayed alone against jan gratz had jacquard drawn his weapon all would have been lost as it was bras de fer noted that the larger number of the crew were wagging and nodding their heads in a propitious deliberation frenchmen many of them they were willing to forget the discipline and restriction of their liberties only one of them ducnois had joined in the conflict against their compatriot ducnois was dead they would be satisfied now if the cause of their grievances was removed there was a way which offered complete compensation with bras de fer marooned with his lady and his imperious notions they would be free to lead the life which billy winch had not scrupled to deny them Bartier, gray-haired pock-marked earringed shoved his huge frame before jan gratz we have deliberated jan gratz said he jacquard has spoken the truth monsieur has fought well he has bought his life and that of his lady san salvador is distant but twenty leagues to the south we will give them provisions for a week weapons and the pinnace and set them free gratz glared around at him and passed bartier at the row of grim hairy faces and he knew that he was defeated with an ill grace he sheathed his sword 
thrust his pistol in his belt and muttering waddled forward into the forecastle with his following when they were gone bras de fer fell upon his knees beside a figure upon the deck at his feet he lifted cornbury's head upon his knee and calling for a pannikin of rum forced a small quantity of the fluid between the lips of the irishman jacquard felt for his heart and barbara tore a bit of her skirt to staunch the flow of blood they bathed his forehead with water and in a moment were rewarded by a flicker of the eyelid and a painful intaking of the breath presently resting upon jacquard's knee he opened his eyes and heaved a deep sigh i am near spent he muttered and then as his eye caught those of bras de fer a smile with the faintest glimmer of professional pride twitched at his lip ah monsieur he said did i not teach him well their thrust and parry do well indeed de touche himself could not have done better i would you had given them less skill mon ami twas craik my favourite stroke in tears he gasped and then his head fell back against jacquard presently he revived and looked at barbara and bras de fer while another smile played at the corner of his blue eye madame he whispered to barbara madame he has loved you long and well take him to london and there serve him as a buccaneer and renegado should be served take him prisoner to your house and your heart and keep him there for as long as ye both shall live a spasm of pain shot across his features and he clutched at his wound bedad he said but the plaguey thing burns at me like a ember it's nearly over i'm thinking rene he cried my dear man if ye tell them at the barracks that i was brought to my death by the low thrust in tears in the hands of such a lout i'll come from my grave and smite ye and if ye see my brother the earl ye may tell him for me to send my pittance to the effort had been too much for his waning strength his eyes closed again and this time they did not open end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the love of monsieur by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva marooned jacquard conducted mistress barbara aft to the cabin until the boat could be prepared and monsieur silently followed his eyes dim with tears at the loss of this friend to whose helpful skill both he and mistress barbara owed their lives when they were safe within jacquard blurted forth it was the best i could do monsieur the very best i could do the danger is not yet past there is no safety for you or madame upon the same ship with yon gratz bras de fer silently wrung his hands it is a desperate journey for a lady tried already to the point of breaking jacquard if they would but land us ah oh, monsieur it were madness to try them again have you not seen their temper no no monsieur i am strong cried barbara see i am strong let us leave this dreadful charnel ship if i must die let it be alone upon the broad ocean that at least is clean of evil intent nay madame continued the frenchman if they would but sail us no no let us go at once i can meet death bravely if need be but not here 
monsieur it will not be so bad broke in jacquard the sea has gone down and although a long swell is running it is low and smooth a fair breeze draws from the west the pinnace is staunch the day is young by the morrow you should raise the palms of guanahani above the sea i shall see you well provided with food water and weapons upon san salvador are friendly caribs and in due course mon ami said bras de fer at last you are right were it not for madame perhaps i should yet make some small effort to establish myself upon this sally they have beaten me but i am grieving little i have no stomach for this life my friend the letting of blood in any but honest warfare sickens me and turns me to water i leave the dogs without regret but you you and my gallant cornberry he paused a moment his hand to his brow then raised his head with a glad smile jacquard will you not come with us if we get safe ashore i can perhaps give you a service which will requite you but jacquard was wagging his head no no monsieur it is too late i am too old a bird would ye keep the eagle's wings would ye pen the old falcon in a gilded hummingbird cage i've chosen to fly broadly and broadly i'll fly till some stray bullet ends my flapping and now make ready madame a warm cloak against the night air a pillow for both thwarts are none too soft and when you are ready i shall be at the door and he vanished his bullet head with its round wool cap scraping at the door jamb as he passed when he had gone barbara sank upon the bench at the table had it not been for the strong arms of bras de fer she must have fallen to the deck tired nature overwrought nerves rebellious refused to obey but a little while barbara dear and we will be alone courage brave one courage we will soon gain the shore then a ship and life ah oh, monsieur i am weary so weary that i fear for this journey in the open boat god grant that we may reach its ending her head fell forward upon his breast and she breathed heavily as one with a deep sleep he laid her gently so that her arms rested upon the table then he quickly prepared a package of articles which would be most necessary for her jewels there were and a packet of his own money he found a flask of eau de vie and when he had aroused her he gently forced her to drink a half tumbler of it mixed with water presently jacquard and Bartier came with the papers for him to sign when this was done they all went upon the deck the spanish prize lay at a distance of several cables lengths and from a movement among the spars was getting under way in charge of the prize crew alongside at the starboard gangway rode the pinnace it looked so small so masterless and helpless by the side of the larger vessels in that infinity of ocean that mistress barbara shivered as she looked down into it but one glance around the decks to where the prostrate figures had lain reconciled her to her lot between bras de fer and jacquard there was but one hearty handshake the very lack of more effusive demonstration between them meant more than many words could have done but as monsieur passed over the gangway and down into the vessel 
there was little in his demeanour to show the sting of his defeat at the hands of these devils of the sea whom he had sought and unsuccessfully to bring into the domain of proper humanity a scornful laugh broke from among the men as he disappeared over the side and yon gratz waving a pistol piped obscene threats and criticism from the quarter-deck but presently when mistress barbara had been slung over the side in a whip from the main yard jacquard disappeared from the rail and the falsetto of the dutchman was no longer heard the mast in the pinnace had been stepped and the sail strong and serviceable but none too large flapped impatiently in the breeze and so when barbara was seated white and dark-eyed showing with a painful effort a last haughty disdain to the rascals at the portholes and bulwarks bras de fer shipped his tiller and hauled his sheet after the wind the little vessel bounced in a sprightly joyous fashion the brown sail bulged staunchly and in a moment a patch of green water ever growing wider flashed and trembled between the pinnace and the saucy sally among the row of dark heads along the rail bras de fer looked for only one and to him he presently turned and raised his hat in salute jacquard replied and then his long arms went flying and his hoarse voice cried aloud the orders to set the vessel upon her course presently the yards flew around the vessel squared away and the saucy sally was but a memory a vessel nameless without identity was sailing away from them upon the sea and they were alone barbara looked no more she had seated herself upon the gratings at the bottom of the craft her arms resting upon the stern thwart but now that all immediate danger had passed and she sat safe and at peace the wonderful spirit and courage to which she had nerved herself in a moment failed her her head fell forward upon her arms and she sank inert and prone at the feet of the frenchman scarce realizing what had happened yet fearful that some dreadful fate had intervened to take his love from him he dropped the tiller and fell upon his knees by her side his mind shaken by the agony of the moment for her face had taken a kind of waxen leaden color more terrifying than mere pallor and the lips save for a faint blue tinge became under his very eyes of the same deathly hue he dashed handful after handful of the sea-water into her face and rubbed her chill arms and hands he poured a draught of the rum between her cold lips but she moved not beseech her as he might there was no response to his petitions he sought the pulse he could feel nothing the breath had ceased oh god had the cup of happiness been placed at their lips only to sip was it to be poured out before his very eyes he cried aloud in his agony and raised the face to his own kissing it again and again as if by the warmth of his own passion he could awaken it to life my love my love he cried come back to me come back to me again open thine eyes breathe but my name come back to me my love he had waited an eternity at last as he put his ear to her breast a sound ever so faint but still a sound told him that the heart was pulsing anew he forced a generous draught of the rum through her lips and madly renewed his efforts to arouse the blood several moments more he struggled in pitiful suspense and then a gentle color flowed under the marble skin a touch of pink rose to the blue lips the eyelids quivered a moment and then opened he hauled the sail to shield her from the glare of the sun and held a cup of fresh water to her lips 
she looked at him but no words came from her lips instead she breathed a sigh and with a faint smile relinquished herself and fell back peacefully into his arms once or twice she opened her eyes in an effort to speak but each time he soothed her and bade her rest he was but a man and it needed a gentler hand to cope with such an emergency but now that the danger was past he felt instinctively that nature would seek in her own ways to restore and he let her lie quiet pillowed in the curve of his arm against his breast and so presently her breathing was regular and she slept he could not know how long it had been since they left the sally but by the sun he saw that there was yet an hour or two of the day the ships were become mere dull blotches upon the sky and from his position the lower tier of guns seemed just at the line of the sea time was precious for the land lay a full day's sail even should the breeze continue to favor them and he could not tell how long it would blow thus steadily fearful of awakening barbara and yet anxious to take advantage of every favorable opportunity he reached for the sheet and tiller and set the little vessel upon her course she heeled gladly to the wind and the coursing of the water beneath her long keel made a sound grateful to his ears he had taken the sally's position upon the charts before leaving and steered a course which should surely fetch a sight of the land upon the morrow if the breeze held and the night were clear he could steer by the stars he blessed the habits of his training in which he had studied the heavens in his night watches wherever he might be there was no sign of any disturbance of the elements the heavy swell now and then shook the wind out of his tiny sail but not a cloud flecked the sky above him and the sea which glittered and sprang playfully at the sides of the pinnace seemed to beckon to him gladly in hopeful augury for the hours to come the apprehensions that he had felt were dissipated in the mellow glow of the southern sun had he been alone this voyage in an open boat over an unknown sea would have filled him with delight but the slender figure at his side which lay pale and silent in the shadow of the gunwale filled him with vague alarms on on into the void the tiny vessel crept the sun sank low in the sky and dropped a red ball beside the disk of sea the dusk swept up over the ocean like a shadow of a storm and night drew a purplish curtain across the smiling heaven the stars twinkled into sudden life and night fell clear warm spangled while the soft stealthy seas crept alongside and leaped and fawned at the shearing prow of the pinnace an arching moon arose and sailed a silver boat high into the heavens but broad affair moved not and barbara still slept continually his keen eyes swept the dark rim of the horizon for a blur of sail or the sign of any portentous movement of the elements he knew the horrors of this southern ocean and the cat-like purring of the silken seas did not deceive him for in the swaying deep he could feel the great rhythmical pulse of the heart of the sea which spoke a continuous sullen ominous threat of resistless might ready at the turn of a mood to rise engulf and devour by midnight the wind fell and with the flapping of the idle sail barbara awoke she lay for some moments her eyes winking at the swinging stars then pushed the cloak aside lifted her head and looked wide-eyed around and into the face of bras de fer 
i have slept she asked bewildered i have slept in this boat he bent forward over her eager delight the clock around barbara dear you are so weary so weary i have let you rest ah oh, yes i remember the saucy sally an evil dream a nightmare see we are born upon a fairy sea all the world is at peace this infinity of beauty is ours it is for us alone she shuddered a little and drew closer to him oh it is so vast so inscrutable this treacherous pitiless water have we come near to the land fifteen leagues at least the wind has failed us but this half hour after you have eaten and drunk you shall sleep again and when you awake i promise you land under the very lid of the eye and you have you not slept madame i am a very owl of birds but i have the hunger of a lynx then while she took the helm he set before her the food which jacquard had provided there were sea biscuit boucan preserved fruits from the store of the san isidro and a pannikin of rum and water it was not until she ate that she discovered how hungry she was bras de fer had eaten nothing for eight and forty hours and so like two children they sat and supped hungrily when the meal was done bras de fer arranged the bread bags and the pillow so that she might sleep in greater comfort but she would not have it so no no she insisted i am well again and strong if you do not sleep i shall not and so resolute was her tone that he forbore to press her further but sleep was the furthest thing from his own eyes he felt not even the faintest touch of weariness she leaned back upon his arm again and so hand in hand they sat in their little vessel mute and spellbound at the completeness of their happiness which even the presence of grim danger was powerless to steal away from them the air was sweet and balmy and brushed their cheeks like the breath from an angel's wing the first pungent aromatic odor of the land reached their nostrils mingled delicately with the salt of the sea in silence they watched the planets burn and glow red like molten iron against the star-bepowdered sky across which the placid moon sailed down upon its promised course flying stars vied with each other in the brightness of their illuminations in their honor and presently shaming them into darkness a giant meteor shot like a flaming brand across the spacious sky spurning and burying in its splendid pathway a myriad of the lesser embers which when it was done peeped forth again timidly upon the velvet night ashamed of their small share of its glory all of this they saw reflected doubly on an ocean of grey satin which sent the bright reflections in wriggling rays like so many snakes of fire to mingle and play amid the glow of the caressing surges which gushed languidly at their very feet to have spoken would have been to break the spell which bound them to the infinite so they sat enthroned in these wonderful dominions of which for the nonce they were prince and princess thou art content he asked at last she did not answer him at once when she did it was softly and with eyes which sought the distant horizon away from him if to be content means to breathe freely deeply the pure air of heaven to thank god for the present to care not what evil has been or what evil may be to be engulfed in quiet delight to be swathed in peace then monsieur i am content he flushed warmly 
and the arm about her tightened he sought her lips with his own she did not resist him and so before the high effulgent altar of god's heaven with the surges for choristers the stars for candles and the voices of the sentient night for company he plighted her his troth it was then that she swept away the only shadow that remained upon their love with head bowed in deep contrition he told her of his madness that first night upon the saucy sally when he had wildly railed at fate at all things and promised to wreak upon her he knew not what dire vengeance our accounts are balanced then she smiled we shall begin anew for i too have many times denied you in my heart and on my lips and i know that i have loved you always Adore, he whispered it was barbara as if to belie her own happiness who first broke the spell of witchery that had fallen upon them her eyes which had aimlessly sought the horizon stopped and dilated as she fixed her gaze upon one spot which trembled and swam in the light bras de fer started up straining his eyes to where she pointed look she cried is it there her rigging and sails clearly drawn in lines of ice a phantom of the thing that she was hung a vessel she had crept up on some flaw of wind her sail in the shadow and now upon another tack had thrown her white canvases to the reflection of the sky it is no phantom cried monsieur in delight a ship barbara chery by her build a man of war not two leagues distant will she have seen us do you think if she has not it will be but a matter of moments he ran forward to where the provisions and weapons had been put under a piece of pitched canvas he drew forth a musket and loaded it with an extra charge of powder barbara put her fingers to her ears as the gun roared forth its salute the silent night was split and riven asunder by the mighty echoes the robe of enchantment fell the prince and princess were prince and princess no longer barbara sighed their throne was but a rugged boat and themselves but castaways wildly seeking a refuge the dream of an hour was over but none the less she helped monsieur load the muskets and cried gladly when a flash and a puff of smoke came from the side of the stranger and the low reverberation of the echoes of the shot told her that they were rescued the ship came slowly down it was evident she brought the wind with her for about the pinnace all was a dead calm barbara's qualms that she too might be a buccaneer were speedily set at rest for as she came nearer they discovered that she sat tall upon the water and the glint of her ordnance along her larboard streaks proclaimed her trade no sign of her nationality she gave until she had come within long earshot then a round honest english voice rang heartily ahoy the boat who are ye whence ye come to this broad affair replied that they were castaways marooned and in sore need of help the ship they learned was his majesty's royal maid war brig of his excellency the governor of jamaica see madame he murmured as the ship drew near tis manifest you are my destiny while you have frowned dame fortune would have none of me and now she is benignity itself he paused sighing and yet i could almost wish she had not smiled so soon her hand under cover of the cloak sought his insatiable man can you not be content it was too too sweet an enchantment 
to be so soon ended nay she whispered it is but just begun the end end of chapter sixteen and of the love of monsieur by george gibbs